Okay, so thank you all so much for coming. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about uh, blended finance and bankability in the water sector. But before we get into uh, the panel, I'd like to first of all thank all of the panelists for coming today and speaking. Uh, I'd also like to thank our host organization, which is IHE Delft Institute for Water Education. And a special thanks to my supervisor, Klaus, Klaus Schwartz, who has helped me organize this panel and also helped me over the course of my thesis to develop some of the research here. Um, so just a brief, uh, brief rundown of how it'll all go. I'll give a brief introduction on um, the financing gap in the water sector uh, and a methodology to potentially bridge that financing gap, which is called blended finance, and talk about this term bankability that's very important to this methodology of blended finance and how we can perhaps create more alignment around what a bankable water infrastructure project or business is. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and start with the financing gap in the water sector. So the financing gap is traditionally understood to be the amount of money or the, in, the investment needs that the water sector has that are lacking. Uh, and there's many estimations as to how large the financing gap is, but many estimates or many people would agree that it's to somewhere around over $100 billion annually. Um, and I think the best way to understand the financing gap is from the perspective of utility. And in a typical water utility, you have costs and you have revenues. And many of the costs you can see on the left-hand side of the screen are maintenance costs or operating costs, things like these pretty basic costs. And a lot of these costs can be met by the revenues from the utility, such as the water tariff or transfers from uh, the Ministry of Finance in that country, or the traditional public forms of financing. But when it comes to expanding uh, the water infrastructure in terms of expanding coverage uh, for rural water supply or rural sanitation, you need um, pretty significant amounts of money to expand this infrastructure in these areas. And so that's represented by these investment costs here. And that's really a large part of the financing gap. So the question then is, how do you bridge this financing gap and how do you get more money into the water sector? And so a methodology that we'll be discussing today is this methodology uh, called blended finance. And very simply, blended finance is just the blending of different forms of capital in the, uh, for a project or for a business. So at its core, you really have like two counterparts in blended finance. You have your concessional investors and the market-based or com commercially driven investors and financiers. And it's really the concessional investors that drive a blended finance transaction. And these investors are people like a government, uh, a donor, a bilateral aid organization, um, an FMO, like we have here today, or Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so these concessional investors um, take on greater risk and accept a lower rate of return because a lot of times it's their mandate to do so and they want to catalyze investment into the water sector. But what this concessional money is intended to do is to unlock or attract additional financiers or investors that may traditionally not be so interested in investing in the water sector. And these kind of investors might be a pension fund or an insurance company asset managers that have uh, clear fiduciary responsibilities that are more hesitant to invest in the water sector because it's traditionally viewed to be as a more risky investment versus if you compared it to other sectors like IT or um, telecoms, things like this. Well, what's really interesting when you're talking about blended finance in the water sector uh, is that there's a bit of a divergence between the theory and the practice. And what I mean by this is that um, there's a lot of literature about out there from World Bank Group or your OECD, OECDs of the world talking about how, what I was just explaining here, how this donor capital can mobilize and leverage and unlock this um, commercial capital and this will lead to these blended finance approaches and transactions that will therefore um, help meet UN Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is the, the basic or it's the, uh, the right to clean water and sanitation. So there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of theory about it, but there's not so many um, practical examples or academically reviewed case studies of this really working on the ground. Um, so luckily today, we have, a, we have a great panel of people who actually are working in this space and are um, trying to contribute to understand how this methodology can be practically applied and understood uh, every, or in many places in the world. But another idea or something I wanna to discuss today is this, uh, this term bankability that's used in very much in common parlance when you're talking about blended finance. I think some people would say that a bankable water project or business is really like the vehicle under which blended finance uh, actually operates. And what I mean by that is that 
the typical phrase from uh, the OECD or your World Bank group papers is that it's not a money problem. The problem is actually a lacking of these bankable water projects and businesses, meaning that there's trillions of euros and dollars floating out there in these capital markets. And that money is all there. It can be accessed if you have an investment ready or a bankable project or a water project or business. But what's interesting is, you know, people throw this term bankability out there all, all the time but it's not so often defined. And I think a reason why it's hard to define it is because for, I think hopefully as we'll see today, depending on where you are uh, as an investor or an actor in the water sector, you may understand and you may define and have different criteria to understand bankability very differently than the other investors that are active in the water sector. So briefly, before I invite the panelists up on the stage, I just wanna show you how uh, we came to understand bankability in the water sector. And this is just one interpretation. And maybe your first reaction is it looks a bit complicated because there's a lot of moving parts here. And to be fair, uh, in a way it is like there are others, there's no sugar coating that to create a bankable water infrastructure project or business, there's a lot of dynamics at play and a lot of risks that must be mitigated. But I think the key takeaway is to understand that these water projects and businesses they're operating in a larger enabling environment. And this environment consists of many factors, including the political conditions, um, the fiscal space, the, the capacity of the local institutions, whether it's at the national level or local levels, and a myriad of other local conditions. But coming into this enabling environment, you have four key inputs that we've identified. Um, so the first being the investors, the investor type, how they invest, i.e. what instrument they use, what type of water infrastructure asset or business you're actually trying to invest in and what is the phase of the project life cycle so just to briefly walk you through these four uh the investor type is perhaps the most interesting one for us today because we have a, a great panel full of people who represent uh pretty holistically this range the spectrum of different investors that are active in the water sector all the way from on the on the bottom you there you'll see a public investor like uh, in the case of the netherlands ministry of foreign affairs all the way to the top a traditional investor, what I mean by that would be someone who has fiduciary responsibility and will only accept commercial, like commercial rates of return, like a pension fund, for example. But then you have a wide middle in terms of um, donors, impact investors, or responsible investors, and we'll get into that. What's important to understand. Sorry, well, you just, you need to really clear, speak clearly in the, in the microphone. Sorry to everybody yeah. online. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good? That's probably better. Yeah. Okay. Will this, this, will this work for the effort on the panel? Okay. <laughs> Once again, apologies to those online. Uh, what I was saying about the investors is that I think as the panel will elucidate shortly here, depending on what kind of investor you are in the water sector, you may have different criteria and you may understand bankability differently. And that's what we want to get at today. Just to briefly walk through uh, the other inputs here. The investors will invest typically with different kinds of financial instruments, such as grants, debt, or equity. Um, and so that's on the, the supply side. But if you see the right side of the graph, you'll see demand, which uh, when we're talking about demand in this context, I mean, what type of water infrastructure asset or business in terms of, is it a bulk water supply project? Is it a rural sanitation project, hydropower, uh, a riverine restoration project? There's all these different types of projects and businesses um, have different models and they have different rates or different rates of return, different risks. Uh, and depending on what kind of investor you are, you may be more willing or less willing, more interested or less interested to be involved in those types of projects and businesses. And the last factor to take note here is the phase of the investment life cycle. Because if someone comes with a pro like a water infrastructure project, but it's purely just an idea, obviously that's pretty risky. And there's not many people that will be willing to take on and put money into a project that's just at a concept with a high level of risk. But as you go further down the project life cycle, through the development, into the construction, and through the operations, um, usually more and more investors, financiers, funders will be willing to actually invest in the project. But ultimately, these four factors should come together within this enabling environment and create uh, a project modality, or what I call here the project modality, which is just a, a structure, a structure that can essentially mitigate the risks implicit from the enabling environment or from wherever the project is existing and create a structure that is deemed to be bankable by 
the investors that choose or are going to be investing in the project. So I'll reiterate one more time. This is just how I came to understand or one way of interpreting uh, some of the different factors that go into understanding what a bankable water project is. But I'd like to now call all the panelists up to the stage, please. And we can talk about it a bit more. <laughs> So firstly, once again, a huge thank you to all the panelists for, for coming today. I really appreciate it. I'd like to also apologize. I know it's high time for a vacation season here, so sorry to keep you away from the beach. But uh, I would just like to ask, uh, in no particular order, or maybe we can start right here with you, Ibis, um, to please introduce yourself, uh, say which organization you're working for, maybe your role there. And if you could, please give us what your operational what your practical understanding of bankability is, or what bankability means to you in the context of water. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. My name is Edith Veldt. I'm the program lead of the Valley Water Initiative, which is a program uh, of the Netherlands uh, uh, RVO, the Action from the Nederland, part of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. And our program, BWI, is focused on the implementation of five principles, the Valley Water Principles, established by the High Level on Water by, uh, of the UN and the World Bank. And uh, those five principles are focused on better decision making, uh, impact on water, uh, making it more equitable, inclusive and transparent. And we do that through uh, our multiple value approach. And that's the link also to uh, bankability. So what does bankable then mean to our, to our program? Uh, it is yes, it is profit and success, but we, we look at profit as being more holistic, also including planet multiple values into decision making, into profit. Because if you look at the long term, you really have to look at uh, uh, the ecological and societal values as well as the economic values. Um, so that that's what bankability means to us. Uh, and furthermore, I also, uh, so we have that multiple value approach, but we also have the systemic change approach. We want to look at water in its whole system. So if you look at the water project, link it to the rest of the system, link it to other sectors, to other themes, and not only focus on, for example, water utility companies. Yes, it's important. Yes, it could be improved there as well. But uh, also link it to other water users in such a water business, such as the farmers, such as the mining companies, so we really try to link it to the whole system. Thank That's you. my introduction. Interesting. So my name is uh, Rick Bokor. Uh, I work as a senior associate at the Dutch Development Bank, FMO. And I work in the blended finance team, but I specifically work on uh, the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development, which is a 160 million euro Dutch government uh, fund that we manage for the Dutch government. And uh, it's uh, structured according to three different facilities. Uh, one facility is a water facility. We actually don't uh, directly manage that ourselves, but we just delegated that to climate fund managers. Uh, FMO is the lead partner and manages a land use facility, focused on agriculture and forestry investments. And then there is also an origination facility uh, managed by SMB and the World Wildlife Fund. And the origination facility provides grants and technical assistance to help projects and become bankable uh, so that the water facility and the land use facility can invest in that. And so I, I work on the, the overall consortium and also help manage the, the land use facility. Um, what's very important for us as an approach is that we, as a consortium, also try to take a, a landscape approach. So whenever we do investments, we, we look at the landscape holistically ensure that uh, water issues are also taken into account when we do agricultural investment. Um, specifically on bankability, I think it's very, uh, how I would define it is that there is enough certainty that uh, a project will be uh, successful from a risk return perspective, but also from an impact perspective. Uh, and I think uh, it, it sounds a little bit uh, cliche, but I think the most important indicator for that quite often is just track record uh, of the business model, but also of the, the partners involved. Uh, and so I think getting projects to bankability is ensuring 
uh, as an industry to, to showcase that, that track record, mm -hmm. ensure that the track record is there, help support new initiatives or initiatives that seem to be working, keep on supporting those. Um, yeah, that's my view on that. Thanks, Frank. Um, yes, I'm uh, Rick Elmberg, Finance Manager for NWP, the Netherlands Water Partnership. And um, I'm uh, here as well as board member of KIPWA. KIPWA is the Kenya Innovative Finance Facility for Water. And NWP is a, um, is a member organization, a member organization representing the Dutch water sector. And we represent the Dutch water sector uh, online, uh, worldwide at events, and also in the execution of programs and, <coughs> and projects. Um, and we try to connect the Dutch water sector with different stakeholders and enable them to uh, create more impact and to uh, contribute to the SDGs. And as for KIPWA, KIPWA is uh, a co-developer of water initiatives in Kenya. Um, and as a co-developer, KIPWA provides, um, uh, provides early stage financing to uh, these initiatives and technical support. Um, to uh, bridge uh, the valley of debt um, and to get these initiatives to come to uh, to transition them to, to become a bankable project. And what is a bankable project? Uh, um, I think if you look at these two perspectives, because NWP is a, uh, we represent the, the, the Dutch water sector, so we have a really broad perspective. And last year we did an overview of, uh, um, of the, the, the financiers within the water sector. And there you can see that there are many different finances, well, we have a, a lot of them here, um, and uh, they focus on different regions, they have different uh, criteria, they have different um, financial instruments, they have different focus on uh, public or public-private, etc. Um, so as from an NWT perspective, uh, bankability is, well, it depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at um, well, more more in depth, if one of the, the programs we are working on um, is the, the investor readiness program, where we uh, help SMEs, uh, startups, and, and early uh, scale ups to uh, attract uh, private finance. And we help them through master classes and, and coaching, and we help them to pitch um, uh, to pitch their their uh, business case to uh, uh, venture capital funds and, uh, and impact investors. But there you see again, you can have a good idea, you can have uh, a good business case, but there has to be a match and you have to be able to sell it as well. From KIPA perspective, um, we have a set of criteria um, before uh, accepting a certain initiative, and that is it has to have uh, a positive social impact, a positive environmental impact. Um, the, the, there has to be a, a good lead developer, a, pro a professional lead developer, and uh, the lead developer has to have skin in it. Um, so they have to be really involved within the within the project. Um, we also look at the, the governance, whether it's sound or not, because these are all ingredients eventually to take this initiative towards bankability. But in the end, if we uh, provide financing, provide uh, uh, technical assistance, and uh, we come to the phase of reaching financial close, then uh, bankability is still in the eye of the beholder. Um, and bankability is um, uh, is reaching financial close at the end. So it could be a match. Bankability, in my opinion, is a match between uh, the financier and the project uh, in terms of uh, uh, risk appetite, in terms of focus, um, in terms of um, no, risk risk appetite and focus, and in terms of uh, uh, let's see uh, a ticket size. And impact. So return on investment financially and return on investment uh, impact loss. My name is Jim. Um, I work with Climate Fund Managers. Um, I was the manager of the water facility that Rick alluded to. Uh, within that, I'm an executive in our capital raising business development team, where I mainly look at fundraising at, at donors or concessional financiers. And the way the water facility works, or any of the funds that the Climate Fund Managers set up, is that there's a climate finance structure where we have a development fund that provides reimbursable grants to projects that are in the development phase, that this slide alludes to the second one, um, where we basically ensure that all the feasibility studies are done, environmental and social studies are done, and where we make sure that a project in our eyes has a potential to be bankable. 
Then there's the construction equity fund that does the equities, the equity part construction. And then there's a refinancing fund where the project would get debt again to get a more healthy financial leverage. Um, the way we would look at bankability, I would say, is, is very much the same as what Rick alluded to, fortunately, because we're in the same consortium. <laughs> but it's it's from a financial perspective, so very straightforward or binary is, you know, would we make the, the return that our investors would like us to see on this project? But I think even more than that, it's some of whether it, from a sustainability point of view, makes sense to do. And this is especially true in the water sector, where you could imagine this is often quite complicated if the access to water in the local municipality, for example, is provided with tax funding or concessional funding and the price is set X. What would happen if a private sector financier like ourselves comes in? Well, during the actual construction phase, Barb was still in charge. You know, we're, we can be quite sure that the price or access wouldn't be worse for anyone in the municipality because we're in charge. But what happens after? And these are things we really need to look at before we can say a project is bankable. So I think it's it's two things. It's it's financially, but then more than that, does it make sense from an impact point of view and then on the long term even after we divest it in the project. Thank you. Thanks uh, well, also for inviting uh, me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here because I've been involved in a lot of the things that we have uh, been discussing. I've worked at NWP. My name is Joris Wolfenrij, so I've been starting here. Um, and currently I'm working for Cardano Development. And uh, Cardano Development is an, uh, an incubator for development finance initiatives. And I came to Cardano Development from the uh, Netherlands Water Partnership uh, with, uh, with a certain initiative called the Water Finance Facility, which is now in-house uh, Cardano Development. Uh, and uh, from that I'm setting up another fund now. So I've left temporarily the water sector. I'm setting up a gender fund now for gender-focused uh, 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 SMEs in Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you see this panel, we see the, the gender problem again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and the water finance facility I'm, I'm uh, involved in from the side at the moment because that is on, uh, on, on sort of a slow uh, implementation rate at the moment because we got stuck in Kenya and that mm -hmm. has a lot of to do with everything we can discuss uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. We've got good hopes that we can uh, get it to float again, and, uh, but uh, at the moment it's a slow slow also because uh, the elections are coming up uh, next week. To mm -hmm. um, yeah, so maybe bankability, the way I would like to define it, and it's a bit maybe also uh, to demonstrate an issue that I see. For me, bankability is uh, defined by the debt service coverage ratio. Uh, and then people might say, and it, it's also to sort of highlight the loss in translation uh, problem that the water sector and the finance sector is, what is the debt service coverage mm -hmm. ratio? That is the, uh, the, the uh, amount of cash flow you, you have uh, available to service your debt. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds very not so sustainable life, etc. But I think that investors, uh, or uh, debt investors, so lenders, are mainly interested in that. And obviously, if you are in our sector, you would like to see uh, uh, good ESG performance, uh, you would like to see all kinds of sustainability, uh, uh, green green lights, etc. But we, at the end of the day, the credit committee or the investment committee will be mainly focused, and rightfully so in my mind, uh, on whether the actual borrower is uh, able to repay the debt. Uh, and that is, I think, the most boiled down definition of uh, bankability. Then still, I would totally agree with everything that has been said until so far. <laughs> However, if you put a knife on my throat, as we say in, uh, in Dutch, and you have to, uh, you have to uh, define it in one simple line, then I would say a debt service coverage ratio of 1.3. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you uh, for the invitation, Wilder. My name is uh, Arno. <laughs> my, my name is Arno Geiger. I am an of the finance manager at Aquarpol. Uh, what that means is I uh, manage the portfolio of our partnerships and our risk sharing capital, uh, which is either in blended finance instrument or more impact linked instrument. Uh, at Aquarpol, we uh, run the Making Water Count program. It's a 40 million facility. 
uh, we basically divided it into three pillars. One pillar to support innovations in one sector, one pillar to support scaling of enterprises, and third pillar is to support enterprises through the multiple finance. That's where I'm working on. And uh, we work with two uh, uh, financiers, that's either local financial institutions, so banks, or, or through uh, impact investors. And uh, the way we operate is that if we see that impact investors wants to invest in the market, we can offer, for example, technical assistance, or also provide first loans. Uh, these are the instruments we speak later about. Uh, I think from our perception, uh, bankability doesn't differ too much from how they perceive bankability, which is, uh, as, uh, as you described, uh, well, positive cash flow or at least a positive EBITDA. Uh, but even more important, it's a proven business model. And with a proven business model, I mean that it has a double impact. So impact on net result, but also social, social impact. And I think that that's how we evaluate our proposals. Uh, that's also how the impact investors uh, evaluate their proposals. But it is a challenge uh, when it comes to water. Uh, some business models uh, are positive in that sense that they're bankable, or maybe offer only water, sell water for premium tariff. So for us, even though they're bankable, it doesn't mean that we would work with them, unless if they have another revenue stream uh, offering for people of the bond period. And that's how we are trying to be additional. So not only purely to rent time, but also again, impact link line. So bankability in that sense, for us, on an MSME and SME level, because that's the, that are the sectors we work with. We don't work that much with large infrastructures, such as crime is doing. Um, that's how we perceive the village. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Adrian Mels. I work with uh, Vine, and Vine is a uh, representative organization of uh, six water utilities in the Netherlands. We have 10 in total. And uh, what Vai does, and what also a number of colleagues do, for example, after that comes to Dom Awas, to uh, support water utilities in uh, their low income and mid income countries to improve their business operations, their financial operations, and actually at the end their impact in their performance so that more people uh, have water. Uh, over the last four or five years, we've started this joint program called Waterworks, which is financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And in which 39 utilities participate, and we help them uh, with yeah, their business processes, improve, improvements. But we also try to make a link and uh, help them uh, to attract investment finance. Uh, the idea is that in total, uh, we reach 10 million people by 2030 uh, by both investments from our end, but also by attracting investments. And that's basically also what I find very much interesting about this discussion. I was also intrigued uh, when you called me to interview me about actually bankability, what's the credit worthiness, because um, I have taken an engineering background and um, being in this domain, I always try to, try to understand what is credit worthiness or what is bankability, but now after your thesis I know there is not a unified uh, definition, it's something uh, uh, like you said, it's uh, on, the, on the eye of the beholder, mm. um, so I think you're willingness of, of an investor to fund or finance definition is quite nice. Because that's actually what we also say. If, uh, if somebody wants to finance an investment for that, that's, uh, that's actually maybe bankability. Um, of the last year, we have been developing throughout the whole entire consortium uh, 43 uh, investment proposals. And when we wrote the proposal, or uh, basically as we wanted to name why, we thought, okay, by 2021, we'll probably have finance sufficient investment proposals to cover those uh, 10 million people. But uh, so far, we agree have been uh, financed. And that's a little bit uh, a challenge, I see also in this whole uh, endeavor. That's uh, it's very difficult, actually. And uh, that's also why I find uh, this, this, this very timely because I, I would like to discuss it. Thanks, Dr. My name is Peter, Peter Den Decker, work uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I'm not your uh, water, uh, not your financial uh, expert, so I won't say too much about bankability because my colleagues in the, in the ministry are uh, way more in, in, involved in that, and uh, also their performance with uh, with these guys. So I'll leave that to them. But my uh, role here is that um, um, I'm involved in organizing the UN 23 Water Conference next year in uh, in New York, uh, where finance is a big team, obviously. Um, background is in civil engineering, 
had one course in financial engineering, so it kind of <laughs> uh, know uh, some of the things you're uh, you're talking about. Um, but um, yeah, I, I like to share a little bit more about the the conference, and then you can see why it's so important to have uh, finance uh, there on the uh, during the conference covered as well, and also what needs to be what is discussed here if you've got there. So, uh, as you all know, the goal of the Public Goal 6 is like, made very elusive and was still not on track. Like, we need to speed up four times our efforts in order to get on track. So, we're not even there yet to, uh, to reach it in 2030. And um, so, next year we have this conference, the first UN Water Conference since 46 years. Uh, and it's a lot. Like, so, you might ask, like, why hasn't there been uh, more? Uh, UN water conferences? Good question. I think it's because water is a very uh, highly political uh, theme and also it's very hard to discuss and get all countries on board. But this is our chance. So next year we have the chance to uh, unify countries to come up with commitments, not only with countries but also with stakeholders, with the private sector but also with all kinds of uh, other sectors that need to be involved uh, on the water. And um, yeah, our focus is first inclusivity. We don't need another company that the water sector is just echoing what they're telling all along because the last conference in 1977 was already good enough in that regard. Um, so we need to have uh, more women involved, more youth involved, also indigenous people. Uh, and, uh, and the elderly community, uh, as well as the, the, the same. Also, it's super important to have it make it cross sectoral. Uh, so, the water sector should be connected to the energy sector, to the health sector, to the food sector, and also the climate uh, sector, if you could call it a sector. But I think. And the most important thing, it needs to be action oriented. If there's no action, you just should stop it. This uh, it's not supposed to be a talking show. There needs to be a real outcome of this conference. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to organize. It's kind of a daunting task, but also really, uh, really fun to be involved in. And um, in order to make this conference a watershed moment for the world, as we call it, we need to have a full and big commitments. And these commitments are gathered in our what we call the Water Action Agenda. And the Water Action Agenda consists of um, voluntary commitments, so everyone can go as fast as they want. Um, and in order to, 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 to structure that, we have used the Global Acceleration Framework, as you might have heard of. Uh, the UN uses that framework uh, because it shows what accelerators are uh, that will dramatically help uh, improve the international community to, to support those uh, uh, this water uh, progress rate right? or in country progress. And these themes are optimized by finance, obviously. Uh, the second one, improved data information. I think that's something that we have not touched upon yet and maybe will in the, uh, in the future, but um, it's important to have, if you want to have bankability, <laughs> there needs to be. Uh, shared data and, and also transparency. Uh, capacity development is one of these things and also innovation and good governance. And I think if you talk about optimizing finance then it needs to be really about coordinating coordination between donors and that's why I like that there is such a cross sectoral or like cross donors uh, panel uh, here because we really have to coordinate how we finance stuff. And um, uh, we have to also improve our targeting in that regard. Um, and the funds that are already flowing into the, the water sector, we need to be uh, using them more effectively and efficiently. And um, yeah, as I said, we have to create those synergies between all these sectors. Because as you might know, the water sector has this big financing gap, but in other sectors like energy, there's so much. Uh, finance already flowing and we need to create these synergies so uh, we can use them also in our uh, water energy. 
and that's why I like what you said. We just don't need to look at it from a utility perspective, but way bigger, broader perspective. Um, and then obviously we have we need to have additional uh, domestic and international uh, funding. Um, yeah, and I can talk a little bit more later on what what type of commitments will we like to have, and also how we can uh, build up together towards the companies. But yeah, if you have any questions, please ask me, and then I, I can uh, explain a little bit more about it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your introductions to yourselves, your organizations, your work, and how you come to understand blended finance and bankability in the water sector. And I think, if anything, like this highlights, and like your guys' uh, introduction to the subject highlights, is that it's not so simple. I think the water sector, anyone from someone outside the water sector as well as people within will tell you that there's a lot of dynamics at play, and it's really hard to balance this financial sustainability along with the environmental, the social, and the government sustainability. And I think, like many of you were already talking about, understanding that water operates within this larger nexus of food and energy, um, climate overarching all of it, it's really important. So I think a, a large driver, a volition to get all of you here together today was because many of you come from different parts of the water sector or different kinds of organizations. But obviously, Peter, as we were just saying, uh, it's a, we need synergy and we need more alignment on how we can create, how we can bridge this financing gap and whether blended finance is in fact the way to get there and whether or not we can create more alignment on understanding how bankability actually practically works and can operate in the water sector. And so without further ado, I guess I would just like to, to pose the first question to the, to the panel. And by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, I'll ask four questions to the panel, but uh, as you in the audience keep, keep notes and if you'd like to answer or ask some questions towards the end, there'll be time for that as well, so please. The first question I'd like to pose to you all is, um, so many Dutch, uh, many actors, including actors like the Dutch government, World Bank, or OECD, suggest that private investment is required to develop water services sector if SDGs are to be achieved, <laughs> specifically SDG 6 here. But at the same time, this actual amount of private finance appears to be limited, especially in countries or emerging markets that perhaps need it the most. Um, for you, what explains this low level of private investment and what are the challenges of investing in the water sector and what needs to be done to access this huge pool of private capital or these commercial capital markets that is out there, but currently is very hard for entrepreneurs in many emerging markets to actually access that money. So the floor is open to anyone who would like to uh, give a response and then we can just go from there. Yours, please. Yeah, so maybe briefly to um Elaborate a little bit more about water financing because of what we have learned, and then I'll come to the uh, to the question sure. to, uh, to the answer to the question. So the water financing uh, tries to uh, mobilize uh, capital market financing. So mm -hmm. we in, in local currency, local capital markets. So in, in this case, we started out all in Kenya with uh, with the help of the uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which have really been sort of an um, a very audacious donor to start doing that because there were not other there were no other donors joining them uh, in that, uh, in that uh, or and us in that uh, journey. But we tried to mobilize uh, local capital market financing. Uh, and uh, we do that on the basis of a pool of water utility loans. So in Kenya, there are about 14 utilities that are credit worthy, mm -hmm. bankable, right? Um, and um, um, on the basis of the, that pool, we uh, uh, were about to, to uh, issue a bond on the Kenyan capital market in order to finance such products, right? Mm. Um, now, the huge, and, and, and now I'll come to the answer, the huge challenge is that the Kenyan context, although it's one of the better contexts out there in, 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 in the developing world, uh, uh, is still uh, extremely challenging in, in, in terms of governance. So, so the answer is good governance, uh, in my mind. Uh, that's the main challenge. So if you look at the Netherlands, for example, uh, the, the water utilities and uh, uh, the, the water authorities, uh, they are, uh, and that's basically the model where the water finance is also uh, based on to a certain extent, 
is uh, uh, are being financed uh, for a large part by the, uh, the Dutch Water Authority Bank, the Nederlandse Waterschapsbank. Now, the, the Nederlandse Waterschapsbank is only able to, 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 to do that by virtue of the excellent governance of the Dutch context as a whole. Right? Uh, uh, it's, it's the water authorities who are uh, uh, allowed to raise taxes. Uh, and on the basis of that, on that right, uh, they have a triple A rating. The Dutch government has a triple A rating. Uh, so the, the, the Dutch Water Authority Bank has a triple A rating and is for that reason able to uh, mobilize huge amounts of private finance for social goods, right? Like housing, because I think 70% of their portfolio is the housing. Uh, but it started off with water. So uh, that's governance. That's, that's a governance context which is extremely conducive for, uh, for mobilizing private finance. Thanks, Horst. Yeah, maybe let me start with a, a more general um, comment on the availability of private sector finance and, and blended finance that respect. And give a bit of insight as to how, how we mobilize private finance and then maybe specific on the water sector. But in general, I think the statement saying that there's enough private finance available with all these blended finance vehicles to, to help the water sector or the energy sector or the food sector in, in emerging economies is a, a false one. Like I think there's very there's very large commitments of donors. Uh, and the European Commission, for example, just launched in their, their new it's 70 billion a guarantee program, the Green Climate Fund, which is a big problem in the Paris Agreement, saying 100 billion finance to be mobilized every year. And it all sounds very nice, but in practice it's not working. It's, it's not being deployed. And I think a very large reason for that, like I've worked in blended finance for my, my full career. Uh, is that it's, it's really complex to get this funding, to get this funding from donors. And these donors, they report on amounts committed, so basically what they've approved, when they're then actually being disbursed. And it's the FMOs and the climate fund managers of results that are, are getting this funding, but I would yeah, be very certain that only a very little percentage of those large numbers being reported is actually being spent. But well, why, well, why is that, according to your analysis? Because I think, well, a part of it, I think a very large part of it, is the complexities of getting this funding and uh, the rules of the game that these donors have, basically. The Dutch government is a really good example for a government that doesn't do it, and that's quite easy and, and flexible and sort of wants to allow private sector investments. But the European Commission or, or the Green Climate Fund for that, it's, it's so complex that it, it does hardly work. Perhaps to illustrate the point, I mean, Jim, for the for climate fund managers uh, to get funding from the Green Climate Fund or GCF, yeah. uh, how many pages was the funding proposal? Um, we submitted more than fourteen hundred pages in, in twelve different languages, include, well, almost including Maldivian. In the end, we could <laughs> tell them that's, that's not needed. Four hundred per language. No, no, it's for <laughs> one document had to be translated to all, all languages. Um, but yeah, and, it, and, and that's a hard reality of it, is that it's the large PE funds that are able to do that. But then yeah. uh, the smaller projects that probably need it more, uh, not. So I, th I think that's in general, point I would say about blended finance, mm -hmm. that I think it's, it's, it sounds very nice, but a lot of it has to change before it really works effectively. Then maybe to give uh, insight as to how, how we do it. Um, so we have this development fund for their donors, so the Dutch government, the European Commission, the GCF, the USA. They provide reimbursable grants. Uh, in principle, in the end of our 20 year program, they would get their proceeds back. But this is a very concessional thing, right? You're not less than looking for a return. Then we have a construction equity fund, which is basically a PE fund, and it's structured for three layers. First one being donors. Um, it's the first cost tranche, 20%, then the impact investors, 40%, and then pension funds for 40%. And uh, this is really what you want to try to do with blended finance, right? If you want to move the pension funds and the institutional investors to go to place that they normally, normally wouldn't. So I think in practice, that's a very nice one out of four uh, leverage. So for one dollar of donor funding, you get four of private sector finance. Then again, if you see how the GCF or the EC reports, they take an average of 17, and you wonder who's doing that and how they got to that number. Um, and yeah, and then speaking through these pension funds, and, and that's more specific to, to the water sector, is that 
what you see is they are getting sort of used to renewable energy and how those revenue models work and the risks of that and how PPA works and and you know they, they have some comfort they'll get their money back and then they have these the trenches under them that sort of provide a capital buffer but for the water sector it's just very scary for them because these are revenue models that um, are not really proven yet in their sector like not the whole enabling environment it, it's very risky and yeah, they're afraid that they wouldn't get their money back so within this value finance sphere i would say the water sector is probably the most risky one mm -hmm. for for commercial institutional investors thanks john so what you're saying is from a donor perspective it's complex and it's risky and what you're saying yours is it's also in the country itself it's also really complex so from both sides from a project side and from a donor side it is complex to get uh, closer to each other yeah. and to get to financial close in the end. Yeah, and, and so a, a big thing for us, and this is also this, this, it doesn't go nice between the donors and the commercial investors in the fund, is that none of these pension funds would ever invest in our fund if we were to only focus on one or two countries. Yeah. Because then they, they would see too many systemic risks and one government doesn't want to work mm. with you and everything goes. So it's, it's spread out over the whole world yeah. in different sectors, different countries. And then combined with this standard finance structure, they might feel like, okay, we'll do a bit. But then the donor, of course, would say, well, let's just go to Sierra Leone and invest the full amount there. But, yeah. So if it's actually because I'm, I'm trying to keep what you're saying, but I would like to give you a, a different perspective. Also, uh, Bunny Water Initiative is financing now uh, the financial, ju financial journey, uh, in which we look at water as a risk and a risk of investment, a possible risk of investment. And, um, and we're trying to move the capital market accordingly. Um, so if you look at the water sector, I think a lot of investments are already made uh, uh, into the water sector, if you look at it as a risk, right? Uh, but I think that um, a lot of investments are already made, but maybe the investors uh, are not aware of the risk, the water risk that's underlying their investments. So we are trying to now also educate and uh, raise awareness among uh, investors on water risk uh, and also at the same time, uh, another track within the financial journey is we focus on the disclosure of data of corporates, uh, trying to uh, really get the data out there, trying to benchmark it and, and, and also uh, uh, try to combine the corporates and the investors together so that build, the trust is built and that investments can be made more waterproof. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, you said we're trying to move investors towards certain opportunities. I think it's also important to, to, to highlight that certain investments should be, you know, uh, and moved away from what's a risky investment. Just want to get like, the perspective out there as well. Thanks. I mean, I, I, would, I, I certainly agree with the point of, of of showcasing how it works, right? Like that, that, that's what's been done, has been done with renewable energy, and now investors are more okay in doing that. And as soon as you start showing that this little water model you can try in Vietnam works, and you can, you can copy it further, investors would be less hesitant to do it the next time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's also what we're working on with uh, with Kipwa. And there you see also the intricacies of, of working uh, in, in this case, Kenya. Um, that it takes a really long time to get to uh, a bankable project because of the, the circumstances on the ground uh, in the in the certain country, and um, it's 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 hard work in that sense. It's hard work to get to a financial goal. It's hard to uh, prove uh, the concept. But I agree. Once it's proven several times in different uh, different contexts, um, then the the, the uh, the concept will will grow and will be copyable towards different countries, towards different uh, initiatives as well. Maybe to shed another light because I see this is more on the uh, utility side and again infrastructural investments. Uh, my experience is more in uh, water enterprises and looking at uh, local banks, for example, because we uh, give us portfolios of local banks that will lend to. Uh, MSMEs, so wash, wash SMEs. Uh, there you see also that uh, there's appetite for them to lend uh, to these enterprises, but many of them lack collateral, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if they apply for a loan, uh, they won't get through the credit committee, so to say. Mm -hmm. So they need additional gear escape through either a guarantee or a first loss. 
And uh, for that, you need a guarantor to do that. But they also need to understand the sector and the risk. So there's still there's also a lot of work on on, on, that, on that end, like understanding uh, the water risk the same as they do now for, for example, agricultural businesses or uh, or like uh, energy businesses, etc. So I think on that end, uh, finding uh, a pipeline of solid SMEs uh, that's also an issue. And if I then take it to the impact investors, uh, we work with uh, several thematic funds, so they focus purely on wash and water. Uh, and uh, as you said, that we need to be diversified globally in order to uh, crowd in the capital. So the investors step in the fund, they will do an assessment of the fund before they step in, and they will see, okay, so how does your pipeline look like? What's exposure? And finding that pipeline, like investable uh, companies, uh, is a challenge. Yeah? Like, you know, even if you set up a fund between 20 to 50 million, and uh, let's say a ticket size 3 million per enterprise, and find that. Uh, in a way that you can promise that return eh, to investors, it's a challenge. Uh, they find that along the way, uh, for example, they find out that they have to do some pre uh, technical assistance for one or two enterprises, affecting the duration of the business. So I think the, the, there is private capital, uh, but you know you cannot change the way uh, the investment world works, mm. right? Uh, so yeah, I think um, you know. Covering this knowledge gap also, ha having, for example, investment managers to understand the water sectors, understand the risk, how you can refit uh, cash flows, for example, to perceive it as collateral. I think you know it needs to be a bit on that level because the model is different for water enterprise compared to an enterprise, for example. So but you yeah. just said you can't change the way the financial sector looks. Right? I uh, there are yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I hope so yeah. because yeah. I think that there is a huge uh, sort of assignment to, to uh, the world is that that that, mm -hmm. that the capital market, financial markets, uh, start looking differently to uh, to investment prospects, and I think that is already ongoing. Uh, however, there is also sometimes, uh, for, for example, ESG, uh, environmental, social governance uh, uh, risks, and, and uh, performance. Last week's economist had a very good piece, I think, on uh, unpacking ESG and, and what makes sense, what does not make sense uh, about it. But in the greater scheme of things, I guess you see uh, a trend towards more sustainability investments, right? And uh, one of the uh, daughter companies of uh, Cardano Development, or one of the companies that Cardano Development is integrated, is IELIX, the uh, Intake Loan Exchange. And they've been able to crowd in uh, almost a billion now from Dutch pension funds to invest in uh, uh, development finance uh, loans, right? So development finance institutions issue loans. Those are often syndicated loans. And now ILIC sits in between Dutch pension funds and those uh, loans to uh, uh, to refinance and or finance those uh, those loans. And th that's a great thing. That's a, that's a great development. Uh, and the only reason that I come back to the earlier point is that a, a system like that, which is a well governed and, 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 and daily in Dutch, you know, a robust system, uh, uh, makes it a predictable, a predictable investment. And predictability is everything. Uh, <coughs> and, 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 and that is often a very, a very uh, weak. Uh, 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 well, uh, weak characteristic of the context that we tend to work in. I, I fully agree with that point. Maybe my wording was a bit, a bit wrong. I think what I would like to rephrase to is that they, the financial, uh, they need to embrace uh, these new directive instruments. But yeah. the underlying model, you cannot really change it. Right? The return is return. Yeah, capitalism. <laughs> yeah, because it's capitalism. Yeah. 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 They, they, they also need to learn to embrace this model. Like ILX and need is a good example. I think it's also Jewish. No, it's that, that's the view, that, that's the funny outcome of <laughs> ILX. It's actually uh, it, it is blended in the sense that 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 uh, the English government, the Dutch government, has put in seed money in order to keep the to keep the, the machine to, to make it operational, so to speak. But now it's uh, pretty unrealistic. Yeah. So I think also a way of doing it, I, I, I hear you saying that there are already a good examples of, of leaders that go towards more sustainable investment. And I also want to point out to the EU and water conferences that are coming up and the action agenda. I think we need to um, showcase those leaders more 
and the UN Water Conference, I think, is a good stage to do so. Um, and also for others to look at those examples to follow. So uh, if you have any other examples, I have really, really several already, I think it would be good to, to also reach out to Peter to, to really find those champions and, and, and stage them and, and, and try to yeah, make investments more sustainable and more in general. Yeah, in, in ESG, uh, in global ESG community, there's one person who, who, who issues an annual letter and, and tries to be the opinion leader in the field, but Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock. Now, Larry Fink is the dark side, so to speak, eh, as compared to where we sit. But I, I would say uh, Larry Fink is great uh, uh, and put him on the spot and, 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 and let him disclose how much his uh, water exposure is. Uh, it's probably not so much. So, you know, it, it's. It's really uh, um, well uh, try to, to, to bring the world together, but I think we all agree on that. Do you think that is enough? Mm -hmm. Go for the gap. These well, are really great, great initiatives. And yeah, I think we're obviously not. Yeah. So, so, so for me, and that's, uh, it might be a bit, uh, um, uh, a bit in contrast to each other, but in order. I mean, you had a transformational story, you had a transformational story in your introduction. And I had, on purpose, a very transactional story, a very focused on the transaction, right? They said Donald Trump is a transactional president and we need a transformational president, right? Because he thinks in transactions, right? And I think that the, that the sort of the, the, the contradiction there, or the, it, it, it's end-end, because in the transaction itself, you learn. And, and from those lessons, you need to uh, facilitate the transformation. But at the end of the day, the, the, the headache is in the detail, is in the, is in the transaction. So you get on the level of transformational discussions, you get often, no water should not be privatized, no water should, etc. But if you look into the details, you often will see that people think it's privatized, but it's not. It's, it, it's like, like, the, like, like you know, what Fanny really advocates. Uh, uh, public ownership, private operations, right? Operating privately, owned publicly. Uh, but, um, uh, and that could be financed privately, uh, right? But it could also be uh, uh, financed publicly and operated uh, uh, publicly, right? So, so, so there, are, there are different flavors and it's extremely nuanced. So, and in the transactions, that is really being unpacked and revealed. So, to, so there's nothing. It's often a very uh, sort of almost value-driven uh, uh, discussion, uh, while it is an, uh, a matter of detail and transaction, which which informs the bigger transformations. I would say. Okay. Maybe one one glimmering uh, thing is that I also last year's uh, saw that uh, take the, the challenge that I uh, accounts lots of international finance used to get financing from them is very difficult. But uh, in some cases, and like Ethiopia was a very nice case, where in that there are uh, local mechanisms uh, starting to develop to finance the sector, and uh, was um, I just came across it uh, by incident, but uh, because one of our project managers was talking about it. But in the Ormia region, the one of the bigger states, they have they are supporting a number of utilities, but they also have an association. They jointly went to uh, the Ormia Cooperative Bank, and they have jointly signed an MOU, hoping to have that materialized to get finance, access to finance uh, locally. And these are really the, I think, the beautiful initiatives, which I see a few places more, like in Indonesia, you have the Nuance Fund, which the World Bank behind that, and are, what sorts of trust fund in Kenya is also uh, an interesting mm. uh, endeavor where there is there is more and more. Uh, yeah, local initiatives and local uh, funds to cater for investments in this case of water utilities. And sometimes I think we are a little bit too much focused on our on the big transactions to the, the international finance institutions or own funds. But somehow I, 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 some, I think actually this, this could be maybe a better endeavor to start uh, embracing those initiatives and uh, fund them. Like the Kenya uh, Water uh, Trust Fund, it was, it was a great fund in which uh, many donors put their funding and was managed locally uh, with small small grants to uh, to uh, in the field. Uh, but they yeah. didn't manage to crowd in a lot of private science. 
But I'll, I'll be honest, in your mind, because uh, perhaps you're one of the on this panel one of the closest people to water the physical water projects with the Waterworks program. What is separating the initiatives in Ethiopia and Kenya that you're just discussing versus some of the other countries that you're working in in terms of why those areas you have traction, you have more momentum in what you're just discussing, and in some places you don't see it in terms of like these kinds of risks that are maybe inhibiting uh, more investment to flow into these uh, markets? Uh, I don't have the full answer. <laughs> That's okay. But I, I think that, well, I see that the, the more developed, yeah, when a country comes, uh, is growing uh, in, in terms of uh, income, like mm. Vietnam is a good example of this, becoming a more equal country like Kenya, by the way, I think there is more stability in the uh, institutional and the financial system, which make, makes these risks less. I think that's a big component. Mm. It's a perceived risk, it's a risk sometimes, but at least people feel more comfortable of investing in Vietnam than in Vietnam than Mozambique. Yeah. So I think sure. that, that, that's definitely uh, a point. And I think, yeah, both, yeah, especially Kenya has been uh, investing a lot in the institutional uh, structure of the sector. It's, mm -hmm. it's a much more transparent sector than uh, many other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. yeah, but the, the, the flagship uh, water deal in sub saharan Africa is still, I guess, the Kigali uh, wastewater treatment plant. Mm. Um, and that's, that's not coincidentally in Rwanda, where, where there's a lot of things are wrong in Rwanda in terms of uh, human rights, etc. But it's a predictable, uh, uh, a pretty predictable context. Mm -hmm. and, and for that reason, I think it was possible to get a consortium organized with a, a developer from the Middle East, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, development finance institutions gathered, mm -hmm. including the Rwanda, who here is it by virtue of the guarantee, mm -hmm. and, made it, uh, and made it bankable, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Does anybody else have any other thoughts on this question, or should we move on to the next? I mean, the one thing that I also, if I look on what, what I've seen in private sector involvement or related finance, sure. uh, say the, the packaging is also uh, an element. Mm. Like, like if you go into investments for uh, one distribution, and what you do is uh, very fuzzy huge investment. Mm -hmm. well, at the same time, so because you're directly uh, investing in a water utility, but if, uh, say, a water treatment or waste water treatment is going to be set aside, it's a green-fenced uh, entity that has much more easy to get fine. So yeah. There's many initiatives uh, for the built up very transferred contracts uh, also in the yeah, Philippines and in, uh, in mm -hmm. other countries where uh, it's are on the lower side of, uh, yeah, I think that's where this is an interesting fine line in, in terms of when you talk about bankability of a water project or an SME or business, you have some projects like if you if you call a hydropower project a uh, water sector project, you have a very clear through a, a power purchase agreement, you have a very clear um, long term stream of cash or revenue. And for many financiers, they would view this as a lot easier to, to invest in versus trying to create the commercial case for a river restoration project where there's no clear cash flow. So when you have trending towards bankability on a hydropower project from a financial perspective, but maybe not as much in some ways from a, a social or environmental governance perspective, versus on the other side of that, a river restoration project, which maybe in, from an impact perspective has much more uh, impactful and bankable in that sense, but not as much on the commercial side. And I think that's why it's just hard to find this, this match uh, of these risk, this risk and return that you see in the water sector. So thank you all for highlighting. Rick, yeah. would you like to add, please? Yeah, and maybe one more point, maybe also going for going to your point. So I, I think it's also like, are we evaluating water enough? I mean, mm. it sounds maybe like a cliche, but one project that comes to mind right now, that we're looking at a drip irrigation project in uh, the Kapu Flats, mm. which were out, out of growth. And uh, what we're saying, uh, Zambia. In, in Zambia, Zambia. And what we see is that uh, right now the, this the super farm, the outdoors, they 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 face increasing water stress and uh, water water risk. And uh, the the power utility is not always providing power, which means that the pumps sometimes don't work. Uh, sometimes there's not enough water to to actually pump. Uh, and in combination with uh, right now uh, increased fertilizer prices, you see that drip irrigation is becoming more and more uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, water and water conservation is more and more valued. So, uh, 
I think just ensuring that there is enough value to, to water is, is I think, <coughs> half of the easy part of the equation. Thanks, Rick. And actually, I think for this uh, for the next question, I think uh, if okay with you, I think you'd be a great person to maybe open up on it because you have experience with FMO and DFCD and working in these investor consortiums. Yeah. And so the question is, uh, in the water sector, different types of investors exist. Um, some may be more traditional investors, like we talked about earlier, which seek acceptable rates of return on their investment, financially speaking. But other investors have a stronger emphasis on these environmental, social, or governance factors. Um, so what are your experiences working with other types of investors and what are the challenges and positive aspects of working in an investor consortium? So I'd like to open it up to Rick first because I think he has some good insight, but then please, anybody else? Yeah, I, I think it's just regardless of working in a, uh, the deep sea consortium, but I think right, while working with the right partners is, is extremely important. And the moment you, you work with an investor that has expertise in that specific sector, for example, then it, it really helps with your due diligence, it helps uh, reduce the overall risk of the project, you really build upon uh, the other investors in, in your consortium in, in that way. And we also see that the moment at Mo, uh, right now, at Mo is one of the larger development banks uh, out there, it's quite a long track record over 50 years. The moment we support the project, it's also easier for other parties to, to come on board. Uh, we also do the, the syndications uh, previously <coughs> mentioned where we, we, we uh, take financing from other uh, financiers. Um, but as a, working at a consortium for the DCDs is really uh, a new innovation, but at the same time very, very important for, for FMO as well. So water expertise is really brought by climate flood managers. Uh, what is unique about it is that we work with s and and WWF that have on the ground people that really help source projects but also help monitor the project and um, through that there is more of a, uh, an understanding of the, the different issues and risks also related to water in a, in a region and you can uh, much more early on see uh, potential risks that are out there with the community, with reputations, with maybe uh, water table levels that FMO otherwise would only uh, see after maybe a uh, consultant was hired or mm -hmm. quite far into the project. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, that, that is a, we think a model that, that should be de-skilled uh, and, and used uh, with other financiers as well. And is there a good rate between the projects being originated by the origination facility passing on to the, uh, to the, 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 the let's say, the, the main round financing instrument? So uh, I think that is the, the, the main challenge we're working on right now. I mean, it, it has, <coughs> we've seen some projects that are now supported, but the bulk of the project uh, still needs to, need to, to get, get financed. I mean, uh, yeah, what was already alluded to before, it is hard to reach that that is, is there any organization facility incentive to be to see it passing the, the mainland financing model? Uh, well, not, not a financial incentive, but as oh, a consortium, yeah. we work on this. I would say like financial yeah. incentive indirectly as well, right? Because you want to scale this program. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're, yeah. we're chatting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and we want to yeah. well, expand it. And if this whole model is not working, then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at some point will say, well, that's not. Right, yeah. So I, I do think there's some sort of kind of, it's not that they get a bonus or something, but <laughs> there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's well, this an, 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 is yeah. an indicator yeah. because yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, with the rest of them, I'm, try, I'm checking uh, the discussion. No, I mean, uh, because I think it's in illustrative for whether a consortium works, yes mm. or no, uh, in this case, this pretty, is, this an, is this an indicator? The, how many projects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, from the origination to the, the yeah. there are, like, there yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, the, it's it's the main KPI the main in KPI. the contract okay. with S and okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it's uh, something we work on collectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you say it, it remains a challenge, but if you were not a consortium, then it will be a, even a bigger challenge. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, like every week, almost every day, we talk with S and and WWF on the projects and, and ensuring that they that we collectively yeah. select the right projects. That you should also look at give us one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think in, in, in really general, like from from what we see going wrong or should be improved, 
is that I guess there are very different definitions of what something is bankable for SBW mm -hmm. yeah. as a as a as a, as a <laughs> yeah. fund. Yeah. Right? Uh, so equity, right? Yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. So there wouldn't be a revenue stream yet, and they'd already think, or not even one thought of, and they'd think, well, this is something they might be interested, interested in, nice. but we would really want uh, to have this revenue stream. Then another thing is completely operational, but uh, it's also in terms of ticket sizes, right? They provide smaller grants, and then um, our development fund starts at some, technically 500,000, but more than millions. Yeah. Than, so there's often a bit of a gap in that. Yeah. And I guess that in organization wise, there's all this internal complexity, right? Communication and um, yeah. agendas of organization that are different. Okay. So it's, it's, it's definitely difficult. <laughs> and, and we're bringing <laughs> we're very different parties together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I wanted to highlight Rick and uh, the DFCD consortium because it is an innovative consortium. You have, for those of you who aren't so familiar, it's two NGOs that are supposed to originate these early stage water projects uh, all over the world. And then ultimately for, for the water facility, it's supposed to graduate to a private equity fund. That's climate fund managers. So you have a marriage, and then there's also FMO, which heads DFCD, which is, a, which is a DFI. So there's not so many investor consortiums that operate and are structured in this way. And it's pretty early stage. So I think it's, that's why I initially wanted to highlight it because it really elicits and it kind of speaks to some of the challenges that comes with creating these investor consortiums. And that's why I just want to bring it back to one of my original slides about talking about how there's blended finance in theory, then there's blended finance in practice. So now we're like DFCDs, I think it's one of the better examples of really trying to take the theory and put it into practice. But when you do that, as the discussion I think is showing, it's, it's, there's a lot of challenges. Then there's some mismatches in terms of how bankability is understood. And that's why it's important to come together. And I appreciate for us talking about you. And maybe on another consortium level, but in the, on the private equity fund level. So we're trying to raise a billion dollar fund. We've done that for Climate Investor One, which was a renewable energy fund, which has the exact same structure. And there's, I think, 14 different investors there, ranging from donors to commercial investors. And they all have very different mandates. And especially donors, but also the commercial investors, they might say, okay, we're okay with your Latin America explosion, your ACE explosion, but we want to be an excuse investor, you call that, for Africa, and we're not partaking there. <laughs> but you can imagine that if all those 14 different investors have a whole list of where they want to be excused, this whole thing becomes an uncontrollable yeah. shit. <laughs> and, and, and that's the reality we're really facing. And some, and some investors are therefore really underdeployed, like we can't spend their money because they have so many rules we don't know anymore. And yeah, I, I guess it's showcasing how difficult it is to, to bring together a pension fund to a UN organization. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, that's my question. Please. Then regarding that, uh, I think the, the conference in, in New York could uh, be an opportunity to, to actually address it, to make clear what we need to ask in terms of, okay, how can we better, uh, how can we improve this uh, so that people can actually uh, be not excused in, in a What needs to happen in these countries and what do they, these countries need to commit, commit to? Uh, so what things do, do they need to abandon and also what things should be uh, created? Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that, but then that's maybe another conversation. Uh, no, it's a, it's a really important point actually. When I was uh, I did part of my thesis, I, the case study of my thesis, which is on blended finance in the water sector, I was working with Kenya Innovative Finance Facility for Water. So I was interviewing as many people as I could when I was in Kenya. And something that came up repeatedly is something you're alluding to right now. Um, we can call it market distortion. And a lot of that comes from what I perceive to be uh, misalignment amongst donor priorities in terms of, I think yours, maybe you could speak to how when the water finance facility was trying to launch a bond uh, in Kenya, if you have CEDA uh, or like the Swedish aid coming in and giving a grant to a water utility with no strings attached, even if this water utility, for example, is credible, credit worthy and can accept and has the capacity to take on uh, financing from a domestic capital market, like a, a local Kenyan pension fund, for example, they have really no incentive to do that if, if there is a bilateral aid organization coming in and giving them uh, grant money, even though they don't necessarily need it, and there's many other Kenyan util utilities that really do need that concessional money. So I think that's I think it's really important. I think something at the the conference coming up, uh, yeah, donor alignment in my mind is something that's uh, pretty near the top of the priority list. Yeah. 
I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Jordis. Well, no, I, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. I guess uh, the only thing that it becomes maybe a little bit uh, abstract again, but, but mm. it, 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 it's at the end of the day, it's about the right price. Mm. Uh, and, and uh, well, no, then, then we don't go there. Then my comment. I agree. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, so the external, the externalities of uh, of uh, all that stuff that we're talking about, if it's not priced in, uh, then uh, uh, it, it will also not be addressed. But but having said that, then you are uh, putting the market very high up in the in, in the higher order of things. Which I tend to be a fan of, uh, as long as the right price is being paid. But uh, you're still any thoughts on that? Well, no. I mean, I'm thinking yes. So what is? What's the value of what we're eating? Mm. But I was also thinking that. Um, uh, so it's what I like about what you're doing now is that yes, you align donors, but you also involve donors in a very early stage, so that you could also align the projects to the donors. And I think that's also in itself a really innovative to put that out there. But I've been working for the private sector for a long time before, and uh, that's not being done that much, at least in the engineering sector. Uh, so I, yeah, I want to say that that's already a good start. I completely agree on that. And we're, we're working with Axiom, uh, they're setting up a sanitation and water index that, again, uh, investing in financial institutions that are a large portfolio, setting up one large portfolio. And the fund is still under development, but there uh, we are one of the funders. We are giving an interest rate discount to the types when they receive a specific impact target. So it's, it's kind of a financial compensation, so to say, that's the idea. But it lowers their interest rate. So, uh, uh, so they have an exposure of that to Action, for example, but it lowers, it lowers it. But it gives them an incentive to lend to wash. And I think uh, it's very important that you're on the early stage involved in Optium because at the end they're an asset manager and they don't have the capacity to understand uh, the watershed or the way we do it. And same with another consortium partner where it didn't have Finnish Mondial, that's more a sanitation focused partner. We don't have the knowledge that they have and they provide TA on a level that they can help uh, at local MFIs or FIs in uh, technical design of sanitation infrastructure, etc. Because you want to provide good quality, right? Uh, if you want to measure bottom line, uh, not double uh, bottom line impact, you need also that your uh, wash facility or sanitation facility being financed is of good quality. And that's not something an investor can do on its own. So you need to read that alignment, <laughs> and that's also you know, a good pitch that, that you can have to attract capital. Yeah. So it's very important to be uh, for us as well. Can I elaborate a little bit further on this example? Please. Because sure. Finish Mondial, I find one of the coolest projects uh, around. Uh, and I've, I'm proud to be happy to in it but, uh, when I uh, worked with Amrit before the uh, health NGO. But, um, and, and then to make it extremely sort of uh, plot geslagen, to make a very flat uh, statement, is the reason why Finnish, in my mind, is, is a very, uh, uh, very uh, successful consortium is because the CEO of Actium Impact Investing, Theo, is a very good friend of uh, uh, the CEO of Finnish or of the, the guy working the waste founding. Mm. They, they simply, they love each other and they, and they make this work and they are extremely aligned in, in what they, in their vision, right? So th that, that makes them uh, very complementary and, and Vanting focuses on the facilitating part and on the capacity spending part and Theo focuses on the investors and on the, and on the financial engineering part, etc. Mm. And it works, but it would have been a nightmare if they wouldn't have liked each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's a simple example. Mm. Yeah, I think finance is, while it's very deep in the numbers that a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, it's a very relationship-based. Mm. I think that's something I've learned over the past couple of months. Is anybody else have any thoughts on Yeah, process? some time ago we did a market analysis uh, together with FMO. Um, and there, uh, I think it's good to see that, that you are now, in the market analysis, uh, one of the conclusions was that uh, the, the, uh, the market was too fragmented, um, everybody has, has different, uh, different criteria, and now you're in the middle of, uh, of a consortium. It, it was the call, there was a call for a consortium, call for structured financing, um, and uh, now you're experiencing the, the challenges as well. And I think what, what Iris also said, and um, uh, Arno also said, is if you uh, 
And then within Kipa, we also see um, uh, the, the hydropower plants you mentioned uh, mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, it, it's been a it's been a long road toward the financial close, but the investor that eventually will, uh, uh, will provide us a financial close is already involved in the early stage, mm -hmm. um, and we just have to wait for a power purchase agreement. And we already know it it will be it will come to a financial code because it has been involved already otherwise you you get a power purchase agreement and then you have to find an investor and then you start from there mm. and that slows everything down and if, if you look at the, the market analysis as well you see all these phases all uh, lining up to each other if there were uh, if there was a line then we can make things much easier and that's something we should all together i think uh, make sure that we we are able to do this yeah, we are quite Maybe just uh, close off this question. I'd like to ask uh, the Rick or Jim one more time because uh, I think the BFC is a really interesting example of the investor consortium. Maybe we've highlighted a lot of the challenges, but I was curious about maybe in your eyes, what are some of the benefits or what are some of the positives that have come out of BFCD when it comes to working together in this consortium to get water projects from origination to uh, constructions and operations? I was wondering. The start of that. Right. Um, so I, I think the, 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 the main advantages we've been seeing is from Victor to earlier, it's really being present. So the WWF and SP have local offices and they know local context like way better than, than we would ever do, which is really important, especially with something as sensitive as public services like, like water. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I would mention is that in a weird way, uh, like if FMO invests into something, it's seen as approval, stamp of approval for other investors. Oh, they have, they have done their due diligence, we can come in as well, which makes mobilizing finance a lot easier. I totally agree. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, or if Cagano does it. Um, but you, you. Way less so. It's really, if FMO takes the steps, that's it, and it's, yeah. Um, well, we can see a lot with donors when speaking to them for, for our, our fund is that they, they really like WWF and s and being there and they have a lot of trust in these organizations and they feel they're more part of the design if they're there than if they wouldn't be. Yeah, maybe to, to add to that, uh, yeah, I, I think it's really, in a, it's, it's learning from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's then ensuring that they know the, the right projects are, are, are selected. But it's also for FMO, um, uh, also looking at, for example, water risk uh, when it comes to uh, potential agriculture investments. Uh, we we, uh, we, we uh, stop some projects that look so sustainable, but if the water isn't, tables aren't right, then you shouldn't continue with that. And I think that is uh, that, that collective learning uh, and quite easily having a, a local context. Uh, that, that really knows a lot about the region, I think is great. Next to that, uh, I think these organizations also push us towards more innovation, innovative projects. It, it's not the easiest projects that they bring forward. Uh, and um, sometimes you also need to do some more difficult projects, I think. And I can add that my experience that yes, uh, local context is important, local contacts are important, building trust is important. But um, uh, I think the, the transparency on data and the monitoring of data on water is also important, and uh, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, I think uh, when you look at local context, most, you know, in the Netherlands we know a lot about our, our, our ground and the water that we have. Uh, in other countries they don't, and it's very difficult to monitor, or maybe they lack the capacity or, uh, um, to monitor. And I think if we could also tackle that part, uh, uh, of, of, because then I think we would also uh, gain more trust within water business to come forward, that there is a, a risk of blood, because it's, it's about minimizing, investments is about minimizing risk. And uh, it's very, difficult for farmers to be the first one to say, I do not have enough water to water my plants. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to build the trust so that they can come forward collectively and also with the other water users to say that there is a big well, risk if, you know, if, if that water is not 
uh, being monitored and it, it, it is not it is not being looked at. So I think in placing water in a more systemic way again, we really have to build the trust within the local context for different stakeholders to come together and to talk about water and to talk to investors on minimizing those water risks, on minimizing, uh, so trying to uh, focus on drip irrigation for farmers, but also talk to the mining industry on making it more efficient, but also having that water better view and not only one stakeholder view, mm. and not only based on one contact in one local office. I really think we should look at it in a more broader sense. I like your perspective a lot. So. Thank you for that, and I think that's uh, part of the driver as to why we wanted to host the event here at Aichi Delft Institute for Water Education, because historically uh, I think Aichi is more, it's uh, tailored towards engineering programs, like this is a school full of very, very brilliant sanitary engineers, water supply engineers, people who know like water data science better than uh, most people in the world, I think. But uh, in terms of uh, water economics and finance, I think this is something that there's the classical divergence between the technical side of water resource management and like the world of investments. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to have a panel like all of you here today to help least sort of bridge these gaps a bit more because I think a lot of people look at them in some ways with the jargon, almost as two different languages, but they really do need to come together. Um, and so if, without further ado, if possible, I'd like to introduce the, the third question. So. As I alluded to in the introduction, there's an often repeated line in the literature on water finance, and it's something along the lines of, developers and financiers insist that there's plenty of money, but a scarcity of bankable water infrastructure projects. But in your opinion, how can more alignment be created between these different investors active in the water sector to develop more bankable water projects and businesses to actually access that money that is supposedly out there ready to be tapped into? Any uh, initial thoughts? I think on yeah, the question. I, 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 I think really projects need to originate from the the, the countries and the regions themselves, yeah. uh, rather than from investors getting together. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is really critical. I mean, in that sense, uh, I think empowering local entrepreneurs, local organizations, uh, is I think what should be the priority of solving this challenge rather than getting investors together. I think there's in general that that's maybe the basic question there's a lot of expectation differences. So I think uh, the expectation finance is often big projects. Mm. Uh, yeah. Because the transaction costs are high while most projects in the field are rather small or yeah. are rather small. So that that's and I think what you do in the code development is I think that is a, one of the answers uh, where you start, yeah, start being involved in a very early stage. And you want to at least to involve the final season in a stage. Mm -hmm. But I'm also still wondering whether if we would do that, how many final season actually stay? Because it's, uh, it's, it's still it's not a very profitable sector. It's uh, the, the loan size, the <coughs> size that I think are small in, in many cases. So and on the other hand, it's a, everybody needs water old. So it's, if, if it works, it's extremely secure. That, that is the reason why, it, uh, you know, if, if the system works, it's a very good investment and a very good alternative to government bonds, for example. Because government bonds, oh well, the, the, the world is changing now a little bit, so they will, they will make money a little bit again. But uh, an alternative to government bonds, it, the, the water sector with long, long project life, long tenors, could, could be a, a very good alternative. Uh, and I, what I, in this case, what I really like is the, the pretty recent development. You're involved in it as well uh, with that, I think, I mean, the early water catalyst month. Mm -hmm. So, well, they, they sort of sit in between water works and the water finance facility, sort of. So, mm -hmm. they, 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 they dedicate a lot of attention to the work uh, water works does. So, capacity strengthening at the, at the utility level. Uh, very much also focused on uh, on the CFO role, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. very much on the CFO, yeah. CFO role or within the utility, making those utilities uh, uh, better better uh, investment, either from an equity or a debt perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the beautiful thing about it is it's a two-stage 
approach and there's a kind of grand facility for um, making activities, helping kids in the group and to show their commitment to the, the whole program. And then after that, there's an opportunity uh, in the development field uh, with, uh, with a long financing to a bit of that combination is quite unique. But, but totally focused on your yeah. so, so your examples are way more yeah. in the watershed and right? more complex. Yeah, and, and so it's very good. Yeah, and this, and this is complex yeah. enough it's already. Enough already. Yeah. And, and, but at least there are some examples of it working. But if we really want to tackle the watch problem, we have to look also at the more complex, broader uh, yeah. system. Yes, but I, I also want, want to say that I agree with you as well that there, um, um, there is also a practical uh, problem here because pension funds are, are dealing with millions and millions of dollars or euros a day uh, and, uh, and the bankable projects that engineering consultancy firms are talking about, uh, if not related to what utilities or hydro or hydropower plants, are basically maybe up to a million or two. So uh, pension funds themes and uh, personnel, it's just there's not enough personnel to focus on those small projects, on those small bankable projects. They 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 look at projects when it's when it's, there, it's about five million or so, and when it's about in different countries, for example, you also said. So you cannot. So there's there's this gap of knowledge, I think, as well. I think for pension funds, you would need to add a few zeros. Yes. And so that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, they, they would be investing in funds. Mm -hmm. yeah. So air pooling is uh, the key word. Yeah. yeah, but that's a, that's a trust factor, I think. But if you, if you look at, at um, a pension fund or insurers, um, they, if, if you look at water risk, what you mentioned, there is, uh, all, all their investments are, are related to water in the end. So there is a need for all these, these huge investors to invest in water. Um, so, so I, I can't think of uh, a reason why they would not invest in water other than the, the, the reasons of uh, them being big and the project being small. Uh, but they want to invest in water. So what is holding us back to align those, those, those large investors mm -hmm. and then going smaller and smaller? And in the end, the projects are perhaps too small. But if you collect them and you have a funding between and uh, there's enough trust in the fund or uh, as from the, the, the market uh, analysis as well, uh, a, a one-stop shop, as we called it in the, in the analysis, for projects and investors to come together and to be aligned. What What is, yeah, I can't figure out what's holding us back. Of course, there are a lot of reasons, but still, I think there should be a way. I mean, you also have to, to understand that, that I, I, I like your question and being so open, but I think there's also an aspect of water is also part of all the other themes out there, biodiversity, ecosystem protection. And so we also, as the water sector, we compete with all the others, I, I don't see this in competition, but for maybe a corporate, they have to, a corporate have to um, uh, provide data on all those different topics, including water. Sometimes. So we have to make it easier for them as well, easier for investors. We may really try to combine those topics better and not only coming from the water sector, but really try to make it to the other things as well. It's a discussion we, we, we get into a lot with our investors sure. and, and our ICs in when investing, or ICs in the investment committee, so they, they approve the deals you want to invest in. Um, is that water can also be seen as a business as usual kind of investment. Yes. So our fund, by the best fund, Plan Development, is mandated by the Climate Development um, Investment, be it adaptation or mitigation. But our <coughs> field teams have to prove this before the ICs. And often with water investments, if you could easily say, well, there's not a climate problem, it's just there's no infrastructure for it, it's just really sad. But that's not our mandate. Mm. And then the whole thing will stop already. So in that sense, I guess more aligned, more aligned than between investors and managers. Yeah. I would say there's also improvement on the. Now we're talking about uh, the supply side of financing, but more demand side. So the uh, enterprises, water enterprises, that uh, also need to work on their model to make it more commercially attractive. It's not safe to say it, but if that's also needed. Otherwise, they they won't be able to attract that much needed capital. 
And I think that there's also a role for healthcare. The more than 50 AI detection mm. system side. Uh, and I think you can leave that up maybe to local local banks, but that means that you also need a team within banks that understand that sector, mm. proper assessment, and also understand that when they, for example, need other leaders that that improves their business models. Mm. And, you know, that would make it easier for them to lend to it. So it's, yeah, it, it improves the, uh, uh, the chance of repayment that they set out to loans. So I think there's a bit along that chain, like with the whole supply and value chain of course. Mm. I think that there's also need of improvement. Um, yeah. And then you make it more bankable uh, for banks to, you know, to, to target their group. No, I like I like your supply and demand analogy a lot because we're talking about from the financier, from the supply side, there's definitely work to be done. And I think a lot of work is being done. There's momentum for the world of finance to more come to terms with accepting uh, water as an uh, an investment that can have actually provide financial return um, to varying degrees, but also on the demand side, I think that's where also a lot of work needs to be done, certainly as well as we were just illustrating. But perhaps well, I, I don't sit in your chair, but I was wondering whether the yeah, could people from the from the room also ask questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> go please. Go. I was gonna. I was gonna. I have one more question, but go ahead. Just ask now. Thanks for um, She yes. brought my attention for a question. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So one, one, uh, I would like to react on what what you just say. Is that um, the point is that as long as we continue to have this discourse that water is a risky business, that there are problems, and all the things that we have been that have been said till now are mostly related to this risk and these problems. And I'm not saying that they are not there, but as long as we are in this uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. We will not solve the problem. Suppose, imagine that you can sell the water as an opportunity to this investor instead of being just a risk. Uh, for example, uh, it was said uh, water is part of all this SDG, and as such, it's complex because it's everywhere. But if you say, okay, water is there everywhere and it can help you to solve all these problems. So don't make it more complex. Solve the water and then it helps you solve mm. the other one. So just think in a different way, not putting a rose, rose glasses, and not stop what I'm saying, but put it in a different context. And it is all about change management. It is about the leaders, that is already what has been mentioned. It is about communication and mostly communication. And I am a water engineer by himself, by myself, so I know that engineers are not very good at communication, but it is where I start. If we can have good communication and explain people in a different way, for example, see water as an opportunity, it's not as a risk, then it can open up a different way of looking at the sector and to solve issues. That is the first point. Yeah, thank you so much. I think you bring up a really interesting point in that, uh, economically speaking, most people would agree that water is uh, investment in the water sector is a huge multiplier in terms of if you have access to clean water, if you have access to sanitation infrastructure, for example, your public health costs, your hospital bills are going to go dr typically will dramatically lower in, in most environments in the world. So I think framing it as an opportunity rather than just a risk because people do talk about water risk a lot because I think from the financial side, that's most people want to understand the risk so they can see what risk they're exposing them to. But I like your perspective a lot. So thank you for that. I was going to perhaps, I was, I was, this is the last question I'll ask and then I want to open it up to the audience members. So um, any questions? But uh, the last question I have is, uh, given these challenges that we've discussed today and the difficult landscape incessant in making these bankable water projects and businesses, um, in your mind, what is the road forward? What kind of change would you like to see made? Uh, what action would you like to be taken? And how can we have greater alignment to, to bridge some of these uh, the financing gap that we've been discussing here today? It's open to anybody. I think um, we've all just mentioned it in the, in the question here before, all these different elements. I think uh, to reach alignment, there has to be work done. There's work done on the, uh, on the project level. There's work done on the financing level. And I think a logical step would also be the UN conference um, to align all these parties, uh, because every, everybody knows it's relevant. Everybody knows that uh, well uh, that, that water is part of all SDGs, and the water is the opportunity. But 
um, to align them, we have to put all these people to, uh, at, at the table and um, make them commit to to working together to uh, bring bring this forward, to, to bring these SDGs, uh, to reach SDGs and to, to invest in water and to collaborate in that sense and to align. I'm uh, I'm uh, so I made my point about governance, but it's often outside of our control, right? Mm. I mean, that's democracy at work and uh, developing middle classes, etc. But apart from that, which we can't control, I'm a big fan, uh, including if it works again, <laughs> which is also often uh, governance governance uh, linked, is local development banks. Mm. So uh, mm. we got the FMOs of the world, and eh? those are. Uh, Development finance institution in, mm. in, uh, in um, developed nations, but increasingly you see, uh, for example, Indonesia has a very strong uh, local development bank called PTSMI. We we wanted to work with them if we uh, if we would be able to scale up with the water finance facility back in the day. Uh, and and, and uh, in South Africa you've got the DBSA, the Development Bank of South Africa, and those those. Uh, uh, those units or those companies or organizations they combine the local knowledge with the with the capital and the financing expertise. So uh, it, it, I think that uh, local development banks, although they are around and they're not not always functioning well, but mm. if they function well, they can be highly effective. Mm -hmm. So that would be my my uh, my blending uh, way forward. So speak. it's it's all about. Local currency, local uh, uh, local capacity. That, that's the way I see it. Mm. Okay. I, I really agree on that because uh, I think many, uh, let's say, that, let's call them early adapters, uh, developing uh, economies for sectors of such as agriculture <coughs> and energy, uh, you see that that's the group that you want to get involved also in the water sector. And then I'm talking about, let's say, a guarantor, for example, African Guarantee Fund. Uh, they deal with many local banks and funds, but they have like this whole product set up for energy or agriculture. What you want them to do is also to understand the ore sector, come with a specific figure, uh, how, how much risking is needed for it, and have a product team that can, you know, uh, talk to a bank when they come for them, you know, some portfolio. Like, you know, you, you really need these players just to also understand, uh, these benefit finance players, you need them to understand the wash sector. And I think of convergence, uh, it was bigger on benefit finance instruments. Mm -hmm. I think only six to eight percent so far have been used for the water sector. So yeah. it, is, it is an instrument being used across all sectors. People are aware of it. Uh, uh, so I think there's huge potential still. We just also need to be able to bring along these actors, maybe repackage, repackage the story, uh, so mm -hmm. to the audience, to so make it more compliant. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, there are quite some opportunities. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and I think there should also be attention for capacity for building with the the one the organization that needs the investment because that's really weak in general, I would say. Mm -hmm. I have the example from the World of Disney, but there are more, yeah, I think that it's more general in, in these institutional organizations that work with water, but uh, in general, they're not very experienced with making long term investment plans and, and then uh, chopping it down to a uh, proposal and then realizing what it takes to start a discussion with the financial sector. So I think it's the other side should also move towards uh, yeah, how, how do I get these uh, projects to run? Mm -hmm. And we have seen a few very nice examples used in the Philippines where uh, we worked with the water utility and through the capacity development we uh, provided, they have more of a better reputation, also have a better, uh, uh, yeah, they have more experience with the director, with more, it comes to the private sector. And uh, yeah, through that step that they've taken, they're also are now able to access uh, two new loans and they developed themselves actually through the loans. That, and it and also was with that was with a water resource organization that is now has set up uh, payment for ecosystem services quite successfully uh, with support of an audio program. That we've been so I think that 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 element of local capacity development. Is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I would say uh, it's a good point also to retain those people that, uh, that people don't run out of the organization because they can get uh, more money elsewhere or a better job opportunities uh, because then you're still back uh, at this point. Uh, also, 
also on alignment, I would really like to, to stress the importance of uh, transparency in, in, in the criteria that we have. Oh, uh, like, uh, what are the, the, the criteria that uh, different financiers uh, have when they uh, want to uh, invest in, in projects or proposals? So that people are more aware of what is required of them if they uh, are developing these, uh, these projects. At the same time, um, um, also bridge that knowledge uh, to the to the demand side. Okay, um, from the starting point, you need to consider these 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 and these uh, criteria because otherwise we will not even consider you. Uh, uh, or if you're really focusing on this perspective, maybe very poor agenda in your project, then you should really focus on these type of uh, one and two. Uh, I think that would help it really well to, to strengthen that. But I think, uh, you know, to summarize, the transparency in the material uh, really help. Yeah, I also just like to emphasize an interesting point, and not to put you on the spot, uh, but as you know, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, I think most, the, the nearly all of the organizations uh, on the panel here today receive funding in, in some form or another from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But it's always, it was just interesting, it was something that came up in my thesis um, about, you know, uh, Aquaparol, for example, talks a lot about additionality. And I just think that's something, especially with the, the conference coming up in 2023, um, yeah, given the, the leverage and the power you have for the voice of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, given that it plays a very catalytic role in the global water sector. Even I, myself, and all my colleagues came, moved to the Netherlands to learn Dutch water expertise. That's why we're all here. And so I think it's just it's just a really interesting opportunity, and yeah, it's a great stage to you know create alignment not only within the Dutch actors, of which we have a good consortium and example of here today, but also to be a leader in this space as well. So I think it's a great opportunity that you have coming up, and um, I hope this discussion will continue to inform that. But, uh, I just wanted to say that. Improve risk and adjust the return profiles, etc. Mm. There's also other instruments and, and that's more impact linked so that you, you know, give a reward for certain impact. I think that that's also a very relevant tool uh, for especially for water mm. because you know you want to target uh, the DOP, so you don't want them to pay premium and you, you do want to focus on, on, on how to reach them without interfering in this model of, of enterprise that you invest in. So impact links. Uh, thinking like instruments, I think in the water sector, besides like the traditional blend finance, sure. I think it's also relevant. Uh, yeah, of a relevant solution. Thanks. Yeah. First, did you have any additional thoughts? Yeah. No. Is there still time for questions of the audience? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Because it's what I'm mostly. No. No. There's. Uh, yeah. <coughs> there's an hour. Actually, an hour. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So if anybody has one last, any last thoughts on this, or we can open it up right now if you'd like to... Um, the, the, the small last comment I would make, and then I started with as well, I, I, I would agree, and don't tell my boss I said this, but <laughs> I, I would agree with more local banks doing it, and mm. more local parties getting involved. Mm. And I think a big, what would really help with that would be accessibility of government finance for smaller institutions. Mm. So again, Ministry of Foreign Affairs does that really well in the Netherlands, but some of the larger players it's not, and then sure. what happens in a it's only 500 million euro programs for which it's worth to even go through that process. I don't think that's what we should do. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you all so much. So now I'd like to open it up to any questions from the audience. Would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Please. Uh, do I need to introduce myself or is it okay? Just sure, to, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, yeah, why not? <laughs> I'm Sofia La Rosa, I'm with Iris Weimar in the Value Water Initiative uh, from the Dutch government. And I wanted to ask you if you all agree that bankability is desirable, if you see it as something positive, because I think we start from the assumption that it is. So I wanted to challenge that, if you all agree this is a, a good starting point. Do you see other alternatives to tackle this funding gap in water? Are there other ways in which we can get there? Because uh, I also was thinking, what are the risks of making water more bankable? Well, we've seen it with many commodities, mm. it makes it more scarce, and, and especially with, as a disputed resource as water, it is very delicate uh, issue to, 
to do, make it a commodity, then we start getting into more delicate a scarcity or abundance uh, or worse on not on, on, on accessing the resource. It's more a, difficult to do. It's a great question. So thank you so much for that. Turn it over to the panel if anybody has any thoughts. Adria? I think I don't agree. Like, because I, I think you need more emphasis cases. At least I, I do. If there's something in innovation which or, or in, yeah, in, within an organization that helps to create a positive cash flow, that, that, that's a business case in itself. And then I think in any case you are able to ring fend that uh, separate entity that might be bankable while the organization is not bankable. So I would think if we directly connect uh, loan financing with bankability, then we'll lose a lot of business cases. I think I think I do see a risk there. Uh, in uh, one of the initiatives uh, uh, within a different program, we have um, um, a water provider, a water provider that provides water throughout uh, throughout Kenya, and in uh, different areas, he has a different dif uh, different business case. Um, so in um, the more high in and more high income areas, he will charge a higher rate for uh, tap water. Um, and in lower income areas, uh, he will uh, lose some of his profit, obviously. But his intention is, is uh, he has double intentions. He wants to make a profit, he wants to have a good business case, but he also wants to provide water throughout Kenya. So there is a risk there. If you just go for profit, then I, I do see a risk there. Uh, if you go to poorer areas, that it is a commodity and not everybody can pay. Of course, you know. I, 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 th I come to an excellent point. I, don't think, you, I think you seem to hint to that it's not a good thing to, uh, to uh, view everything through the lens of bankability or a business case, and I agree with that. So I, I think uh, public goods are public goods, right? And uh, you rely on the government, governance context in order to allocate those, uh, the use of those public goods in an equitable way. Right, and I don't think markets, yeah, which I now would, would sort of sing into business case, are always the best mechanism to do that. Uh, um, however, if you want to get private finance, and that's the crowding private finance, you need to structure it in a way that it becomes uh, uh, attract attractive to those private financiers to step in, and that could be component of the larger story, right? So the larger story is exactly like I think you said that, or that, that an, an, a dollar invested in, uh, in sanitation has a, has a societal ref, uh, benefit of, uh, I think, times eight or something. Nobody can calculate it, by the way, but that's, it has been calculated on a certain point by people who wanted to make that point, obviously. Uh, and I find it a good point, because you saw it in, uh, I think it was Dr. Semmelweis in uh, Vienna in 18 so much, who started to make the link between uh, 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 a lady's giving birth and dying right after that and hygiene, right? <laughs> now, that has been <coughs> public health still uh, the biggest, uh, uh, biggest success in, in human history. Hygiene, right? So, uh, and that has nothing to do with the business case. So, I, yeah. I, I agree on that, maybe to, to add to that, what, what I think is a risk is that we, especially with better finance, is that we make things too complex. Uh, yeah. So I think lawyer fees are, can be very uh, high, I, I mean, very, very, literally, if you want to bring private finance to a public utility thing, you, you run the risk of all of complexity. And I think you should always make an assessment, does it make sense that you bring the private sector in here? Yeah, I got two, two reading tips. Uh, one is Debt, The First 5,000 Years. That's a very cool book which uh, takes a different perspective on the whole concept of debt. Mm. Uh, and the other one is uh, The Deficit Myth, which is about modern monetary theory. It's, it's an alternative, uh, alternative uh, economic uh, theory. I'm not a big fan of it because I think there are lots of risks involved, but it does change the perspective on what money is. And what and why and how money relates to markets, right? It, sometimes you get the impression that the money is the leading concept rather than uh, human uh, welfare, well-being, or something. But then, further to your point. Yeah. <coughs>
Would you like to respond to any of the points, or what do you think? And, uh, regarding the second part of the question, do you see any alternatives within the financial sector to incentivize perhaps more investment that are, are not making water uh, bankable? Once again, I think this is a good question because as the first slide it was about here's the financing gap. It's open to like how this gap will be bridged. One methodology is blended finance. I think that's what the topic of my thesis was, and that's what I'm uh, trying to understand because these people have experience on it. But you're completely right in that there's plenty of methodologies and approaches that can be used to get there. So does anybody, if anybody has any thoughts on that, please speak. So, not the extra to your bag. If we value the, the human value or the human good uh, accordingly and the price on that stuff, then that could help make uh, the business case. And I think. Maybe with, with carbon credits, for example, it can like, do like a minor bit in some of the projects uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to make it more, more bankable or feasible. So, yeah, in that term, I think uh, there are different ways, but I think it's also <laughs> very complex. Uh, and uh, it, it, it all depends on how, how much time and money are you willing to spend on making that case. Um, but I think it's possible. So we, we should definitely be looking uh, for more of that. Um, yeah, I think it's a difficult one because mm. um, we have a so-called impact link fund and that's really targeting uh, well, rewarding impact. Uh, but still, uh, one of the requirements is that it's a proven business model uh, that's generating certain revenue and that's able to attract repayable investments. And even though we, for example, uh, reward them with social impact uh, payments, so it just, uh, for example, you said the example that the multiple tariffs want a bit more expensive, that's why the business model works, but then you research the communities. Uh, that rewards, uh, it rewards uh, in a way that um, uh, the enterprise is compensated so that they don't have to ask higher tariffs in certain regions, so that the people are able to, to pay for water. But still, the underlying model of the enterprise still has to be of a certain solidity. And you know, they need to be able to speak with other investors or banks. So I think that that's just, that's just how it works in that sense. Uh, you cannot, yeah, otherwise it's really uh, a social enterprise you're referring to or an NGO, but that's not the entity investor will step in. So those are two different things. There's definitely plenty of room for re more research in this space. So that is a great question. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, Sajid. I am Sajid. I am a student. Uh, I'm doing the master's in water governance here. So my question is uh, actually to Arne from uh, Equifrog. So we see that I mean, we talked about a lot of uh, pension funds coming in big projects. Right? What I see in India is that uh, Actium has leveraged some pension funds to uh, microfinance institutes in India. So which is like, you know, like personal loans either to like customers themselves for sanitation projects or to enterprises. But what I see, the challenge is that, you know, these microfinance institutes, as you already mentioned, like there's, so they don't have a certain portfolio for water and sanitation. So it's very difficult to, you know, convince microfinance institutes as you also reiterated the fact that, you know, it's important to have local players in the game. But the local players to make the game more attractive to them to make these uh, loans very to develop their portfolio is difficult because we there's some I feel that there's a gap between you know working with local NGOs to you know fill that gap. So I mean, what what are your views on that? I know like because you work a lot with uh, yeah. my yeah. That's, that's a great question, and uh, I think technical assistance uh, is again uh, would be a good solution for that. We need to uh, we need to offer them capacity building uh, in the sense that uh, they need to be uh, need to develop a product that's later to uh, household lending, I think you're referring to, for a wash, right? Yeah, so, and, and same as with Agri, the uh, wash loan product, uh, even for MFI, uh, has certain characteristics, certain tenor, and, and I think you need to understand that as an MFI. And understanding that costs cost money, right? You need to do community study, etc. Uh, have to loan officers trained, uh, you need to understand the business models, and I think that, 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 that MFIs and also investors should not underestimate if they want to set up a build a portfolio consisting of MFIs for wash, that that's also part of the of their work. Otherwise, uh, you risk having FIs or MFIs that will use the, the investment of, of 
the investors and just lend it for completely different sectors because they have to pay back the interest. Mm -hmm. So and you and you want to protect it uh, you, because otherwise you don't reach your impact loss. Yes. Again, the bottle, uh, the, the, the double bottom line of the mm -hmm. You want them to pay back the investment, but you also want them to reach that impact goal. I think technical systems for that, having Philip uh, Mondial, for example, or other, or Amrit even, uh, or local, yeah. I work with local consultants, such as Intelligent in India, etc. I think uh, they have very strong wash teams, Dauber, uh, they can really uh, help uh, support MFI to set up like wash uh, product in the market, but it costs money, and that must come from donor, because it's that certain. But then, then if, I may, if I may, I think that I'm sure, but I, it does happen. Like, uh, like an FMO of the world would provide a loan to a local bank in India for their rush portfolio, which would be a, a small part of their total portfolio. But also, what you see is that the DFIs that provide this loan are against a more concessional rate than the bank would get from other financiers. And then there's clauses in their contract that that loan can only be used for their rush portfolio. It gets more complicated with the end beneficiaries, so the households here, like. Do you also give them a cheaper rate, which is mm -hmm. often not doable because then you get in a fight with people saying, oh, they get a rate for YX and why get it for Y. That's complicated, but there are financial incentives. Too. But then uh, for households, then I think it's important to look at the whole celebration service chain as one because if you start investing in small businesses like shops that sell soaps or washing powders, there is a higher rate of return. I mean, it's then it gets easier for you to recover the loan and like from these enterprises. But there's a disconnect in viewing them as like different enterprise loans or household loans. There's a, like they don't view the whole service chain as one. Well. Yeah. No, I and that, that that's completely right. I think that's a whole issue or something all that you should look at the difference between LCBs and, and, and households. It's a discussion you would have in that opinion. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Algi. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh, discussion. Uh, so my name is D. Allards and I have worked for 20 years with the World Bank in water financing. Uh, so this is a subject close to my heart. Uh, one thing that uh, struck me, maybe two comments. The first comment is a very simple, practical one, and it is that <clears throat> when it comes to bankability, it's about good housekeeping, it's about book accounting. And so I would recommend that. Um, they, for example, spends ample attention to educate uh, the uh, water utility staff in having books that account, accounts that uh, match the, uh, uh, the requirements of GAAP or the IFRS, so internationally uh, accepted uh, standards, in order to, because that's the basis for any assessment, right? And so in there you see immediately if you have a proposal. If the books are fine, I mean, well done. It means the organization has good governance, has a cash flow, you know, is capable. Right? So that's a kind of a uh, central point. So that's the first comment. Um, uh, very practical. The second comment is about um, the observation that all of you talked about the fact that a financier needs knowledge about the sector. <clears throat> so that's a major impediment to coming together and making it work, making the money flow. And uh, so, and it's obvious, it's normal because these financiers are very specialized in the retail services, in, 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 uh, in real estate, in, uh, in chemicals. So it's, it's a very fragmented business. So the water business is very fragmented between irrigation, irrigation people, water supply people, they don't talk to each other. But in the financial world, it's even worse, right? So they are so specialized. So the challenge is how to get, how to cobble together a consortium where they complement each other and work together. Now what I observe is that, um, um, so where we see progress is where we have some kind of an intermediary organization. Uh, the uh, example has been mentioned of the Dutch Water Bank, the Water Bank, uh, which is a bank but sits between the water sector and the financial sector. And they know everything about bonds and, and Frankfurt and the uh, Zuidas and the city, you know, how to get capital, you know. And they know everything also about the water sector. So what kind of um, uh, demands 
uh, needs exist in the uh, or so water companies and uh, 20 water boards in the Netherlands. Right? So in Germany, you have the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, TWU, which is a very similar type of organization. Yeah, but these are local development banks. Mm -hmm. These are local, these are, these are very specialized. Yeah. Uh, in, in the US, you have the US Environmental Protection Agency, which acts as an intermediary, so they go to the, they have a department that goes to the capital market, uh, brings in money, uh, and then that money is given as a co finance to the counties for their uh, wastewater treatment, their sewers, uh, dikes, etc. And GIFRIS is also, in a sense, operating as the know how pool, uh, combining the financial expertise, right? Local markets, uh, guarantees, and the, and the, and the Kenyan uh, water sector, right? So um, in Indonesia, you do have a very effective um, uh, financial uh, vehicle, but uh, it's not necessarily very specialized on water. So they prefer, these people prefer to give their money to uh, transportation, energy, uh, you know things that are that come from the local government and <coughs> um, so whereas water is still perceived as being complicated precisely because they don't have the knowledge right so i wonder where you know going forward to new york next year we should not make a case and say well we have we have here a recommendation to uh call upon nations countries and governments to set up some kind of a mechanism, it can be many types, you know. In the language of Aquafin, here the nails of Water Bank, there the UCP, uh, you have uh, in, in Italy, which has not had such an um, entity until a few years ago, now they have an SPP, a special purpose vehicle, uh, which is an institution, right? It's not a, a formal institution like uh, a bank, but it, it does fulfill these uh, functions. So it could have many modalities. Governments can find out what works best for their particular situation. And in addition, if you have something that acts like a bank, you also overcome the other problem. And that is uh, too small scale, as Adrian mentioned it, uh, you know, water supply companies or irrigation districts, they talk about $500,000. A million dollars that's already big, that's, you know, financiers don't like that, they want 50 million dollars, right? So, and, and the last to, 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 to syndicate, to pool, and to ensure that transaction costs could get uh, reduced. Partly because of the scale that they can manage, and partly because of the know-how that they uh, have in hand. So I think maybe that's, I don't know where they are now saying something that where you say, well, well, this is too, uh, you know, out of uh, bounds or unrealistic. <laughs> or where you say, yeah, maybe that's something where you should uh, go. <laughs> I don't agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote a nice book about it, actually. <clears throat> mm. I agree. Well, or sorry, I would, just, I would just like to say that, uh, on, once again, it's like, the, in my mind, I, I just see this divergence between the theory and the practice. Like, almost all of the examples of where this is working well, about the Netherlands, Germany, or the US, that's where these are very developed markets, and you have very credible water utilities, as you mentioned, known as Water Bank, and the utilities that they service. It's a triple A rated bond, or like the highest possible rating that any investor would be willing to take an investment on, because there's no risk. But when, when it comes to setting up these kinds of institutions um, in some of the countries, developing countries that we're talking about, it's just a, it's a whole other beast. And I think it's, sometimes I just get, uh, you know, in academia, uh, in this space, we, it's easy to talk about these things. But I think that's why it's a good opportunity to talk about, like, what are some action items and what can we practically do now to actually create these institutions? But there are successful examples. Mm -hmm. Also there, so the, the Tabernabu example, it, it, is an, uh, is an excellent example. In Colombia, there's a very good mm. example that I find in Indonesia. Shanghai. Yeah, so, Shanghai, yeah. So there are very good examples. So, so there's not, I, I, uh, I would say that there's ample opportunity to scale to scale those examples. Uh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can agree with that. In a sense, it's against the interest of most of you, right? Because <laughs> you are based in the Netherlands and you want to do good things in Europe. 
But at the end of the day, you operate from The Hague or from Amsterdam. Yeah, but our goal is to set it up locally. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that's if the is to eventually push everything there, that would be, that's ideal. Yeah. Right. If I move with, uh, let's say, take up such an initiative uh, together with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I mean, I, I think ultimately, I think indeed more more needs to be done 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 locally. But uh, it, yeah, I, 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 I agree completely with that. Especially when it comes to, I, I think especially when it comes to more equity investments, I think it's especially important that's more hands on when it comes to to debt. Uh, it can be. Uh, I think internationally, like large debt transactions, it might make sense if you bring on board international expertise. Uh, but for smaller debt projects, for especially equity, I think local presence uh, is, is vital. And it also comes down to the leadership and project development. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's very important. Thank you for the comment. I think I saw a hand. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Paul Paul. So my name is Caroline Fier. Uh, I used to work at IT long ago. Uh, and now I am a consultant in the field of global climate and data for the world. Um, I would like to make one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is related to my experience in Benin. Um, it's finance and they launched last year what they call the SDG Eurobond. Uh, to attract uh, funding to fund the SDG within the country. Is they make a clear planning of, plan of what they want to finance with it. And water is a huge part of it because they want to uh, achieve the SDG in the field of uh, the SDG 6 in terms of water supply by 2025. So five years earlier than normally. Uh, so, and they have been very successful. So uh, maybe it's uh, interesting for you to look at this experience. Uh, and I mention it because it's French speaking in Africa, and often uh, research or people are not well aware what is happening in French speaking Africa because it's reported in French and not in English. So maybe it's worth for you to have a look. If you need more information, I can uh, share that with you. Um, the, the question I have is uh, more uh, related to uh, also to what um, we have mentioned about uh, the lock-ins that you have in uh, systems and organizations that are making that stop moving. And uh, uh, why I'm mentioning that is that um, I, I think I'm working at the moment on a uh, study for the Global Center of Adaptation about mainstreaming. Uh, water climate adaptation in the policy in the different country, and one of the things that's coming out of it is really that some of the uh, the, the mainstream is not always working because of this blocking. So now I'm making the parallel with the finance sector. I mean, many of the things that have been said now, I mean, we have already said 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So there is really a need to change and do the things differently. So somewhere there are locations and blocks within the system that are making that it's not working. So uh, my question to the, the panelists and, and the, the, the people around us, what, uh, not only looking at what the authors are not doing, are not doing well, but what are the things within our own organization that are blocking or blocking the evolution of the system that we do not see. And, and we, we, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. So where are these blind spots? And, and this is what uh, uh, also he was saying. Uh, we are all here to help. And uh, we want to be uh, um, redundant at some point, but what is making that we are not redundant? And, and maybe it's also be a, a way forward to help funding and, and to help financing the water sector because we are able to identify the blockage within our organization, within our, ourselves, and not only looking at the others. I hope it's first clear. 
Sen blev det tatt. Yeah, but, but it's, it takes a lot of collaboration with me and joint journey and, and real dialogue about uh, what together. Yeah, I've, I've been uh, privileged to be working with a lot of uh, multi utility directors over the last 10 years. And, um, what I've seen is that there is a group of people that are not really interested in the organization and come forward with another group, a little bit smaller group, and they are very creative and they are very motivated. And I think what I've learned, and that's also what we do more and more, uh, is that we don't focus on a letter group, because I agree with you in the local uh, creativity, in the local um, yeah, power to change. And I think uh, what I've seen also that people, with, even with little means, they are able to improve, yeah, improve their organizations and uh, bit by bit get more time and get, get, get better in their organizations. But that, that motivation and leadership that we really use before. Uh, and, and the key people is 25 percent. You just need 20, 25 percent of the people in the organization. And that's Spencer. Exactly. And then you get the whole organization. Yeah. And the first one is the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to add also uh, to the very important initiative we have um, an activity focused on um, what is supplied with the beginning of companies uh, to empower local employers. So not at CEO or CFO level, but really from the bottom up and to, to see really reflect on themselves, why are they doing what they're doing, what is their value of working there. And um, so there's an empowering program to really motivate the most motivated even more to grow into, um, into their own company and into their own communities. Um, but reflecting as well on uh, RBO, uh, as well, what, what can we do better? I think, uh, yes, we might have talked about the same 20 years ago, but much, much has been, been done as well. Uh, we are uh, now involved with the different financial partners uh, trying to uh, yeah, dis disclose data of corporates and trying to help them accountable. Uh, and I think we can do much more in that sense. We can do much more in raising awareness on what are within different investors or to different investors. And I think this is only a small start. Uh, but but so, so I would like to do more on that side. So, yeah. Thank you for your thoughts. Is there, is there I think I saw you were happy your hands first last time. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Romy and I'm working for Omrah for the Netherlands. Um, with Omra, within Omrah we're trying to make our projects less dependent on donor financing. So for bankability, really ideal goal at one point, I think less donor dependent is already a step forward for us. Um, and we've been talking about bankability quite a lot and, and we're now trying to implement a project in, uh, in Kenya where we are aiming to set up uh, rural water supply businesses. And I was just wondering, are there any examples that you've come across of projects that are actually bankable and not just less donor dependent? Uh, in, for example, water supply in more rural areas, so in the areas where there was utilities don't uh, don't reach. Um, are there any examples, and what are then their key success factors? Yeah, well, yes, sir. Um, not per se Kenya, but uh, examples in the, in the Senegal, you have Swiss fresh water. Uh, they have this uh, precise model with uh, local uh, 
uh, water vendors, and uh, it's an interesting model. It, it attracts the interest of investors. Uh, and you also have GBU, for example, that actually receives investments from uh, I think Total Capital and other, and we also de risk it. <laughs> so I think that that fuel smoke model is, is, could, could be uh, a decentralized uh, water system that's a bit more complex because they need a lot of data. I'm a bit technical now, but I just want to point out that, that there is there is in appetite uh, because yeah. of the uh, large impact uh, footprint, uh, and usually these, these business models allow to uh, sell, uh, for example, two type of products: and one uh, better treated water at a higher premium, and one maybe uh, less treated but still very good enough for uh, a thing. So I think that, that there are several examples. Uh, I think to share a few. <laughs> If you want that, I'm not separate uh, about this, but uh, yeah. <coughs> and also banks, uh, the banks I work with, uh, if I look at the pipeline and the one uh, there, for example, Kenya, I think nearby Nairobi, you have, in, you, have, you have private, they're not even water utilities, but they're private water suppliers that actually have a water tower and, uh, and in the financing for solarization, but they also have their own household connection. And the nice thing about these models is that uh, they generate revenue, and once clients, uh, once they have clients themselves, and once you have a water uh, resource as a client, you know you always will pay for it because you know it's a luxury you won't give up easily. So you know it's a solid business model also for banks. So definitely uh, local water supply companies they exist. Yeah. And in Kenya as well, yeah. uh, the one I mentioned. Uh, I was about to say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, now in Kenya as well, the, um, the one I mentioned with uh, the, the diversified price uh, throughout the, uh, the region, um, the, there's a, a multiple phase business case. And the first business case was uh, in a region with a higher income. Um, and the second business case is to expand towards other regions and diversify in, uh, in the price. And, and, also with, with uh, and also the product, so focus on different uh, customer groups so they yeah. can balance yeah. it up. Thank you for these examples. Uh, Inak, did you have a question? Oh yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. I am Inok Moyo. Uh, I work in the ocean right now, but um, I'm here for this particular discussion on water, water financing. Uh, I've listened, and one thing I catch is we are quite focused on water supply and already established entities. Uh, so my question then goes to focus on SaaS startup, hypothetically you have a startup and it's not generically water supply, but it's still in water say groundwater exploration uh, for agriculture, let's say. And some some of these facilities, these funding facilities are really hard to get by, even for, for startup especially, because the requirements are order and a startup would require a consortium but then to get into a consortium the members of the consortium must be trusted which is also a tricky thing to do my question then is what are, <coughs> what what are the, the how, how would you make it easy for this, this startup to get access to That's a good question. I think it feeds into, if you remember the, the framework at the beginning, you're talking about the, the phase of the investment. So what you're talking about is a concept. So at the conceptual phase, where it's very risky, as I think you're describing, that's where it's hardest to get the money. So I think if anyone has any thoughts about investment phase risks and what you're supposed to do as a water entrepreneur at the earliest phase, because as Enoch is saying, it is it's very difficult. Very difficult. You, you kind of answered the question by, by itself already, like a, a partnership is typically the, the best way forward. So if you have a very innovative idea, uh, ensure that there is a good sponsor, an organization with a track record that you can, can work with and that can, uh, can help you. And, and then together you can uh, check, check finance. And ideally, uh, yeah, the, the sponsor also supports you early on. Uh, maybe provide some, some equity finance, for example. I mean, through that we can apply uh, the debt funding. That I think is the 
the, the best way at least to get financing from a, a DFI. So of course, there are different programs out there. I think there are a lot of incubator venture capital programs uh, these days uh, <coughs> that, uh, that provide grants and, and, and earlier stage finance. But uh, we, uh, as a small, we do that indirectly. Yeah, and with the, within NWP, we also have the investor readiness program, and that is for uh, Dutch startups. Um, and uh, there we provide uh, know how. We provide uh, uh, master classes. We provide um, uh, coaching for startups and, and early scale ups, and eventually match them to uh, to financiers, uh, financiers um, to pitch their their business case. So uh, we help them build a business case. We help them pitch a business case, and eventually, hopefully, come to first initial investment. Invest investors eventually. Also, accelerator, accelerator programs locally, maybe. I think they help you to cover costs and structure your organization. Um, maybe find foundations that can support you on a grant basis. Make sure your entity is a private company and not an NGO, for example, or small direct investment. And uh, stay away from bank financing at the start. Yeah. First of all, you're going to have collateral, second of all, interest rates are always too high. So maybe you look for one that can offer soft loans. Foundation, so like you know, a repayable grant, at least so that they see that you're able to generate operating profit. You know, so you have to think already from the start as what would an investor would like to see, and I think you know that's important. So they use uh, all the, the three apps of family, friends, and fools. In the start, in the start, uh, it's it's always so risky that you uh, that you uh, that that's not necessarily good news, but at the same time it's. Totally, I mean, it's the engine of, uh, of economy is for startups, I would say. Uh, and and uh, they always rely in a in, in few years, in the first few years, on family, friends, and fools. <laughs> <laughs> the fools are the typically the, 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 the I mean, any, any venture capital, uh, so that those are the, the private equity investors in very rich days called venture capital. And, and all venture capital investors, all their strategies, they can talk very nicely about it, but it's actually shooting 100 times and hitting two times, right? So, uh, and, and, and if that those two times go 100x, then the 98 uh, don't really count anymore because they've made the profit. In the case of those 98, they've been fools. <laughs> Right. Okay. Um, I'm just interested to know the final um, the impact of special plan uh, in the experience of the way you're uh, trying to invest the market, the market. If you look at most of the regions where you're trying to invest, I think there are legacy issues such as uh, the rural areas, but very spaced out. Mm -hmm. right? But if you're looking at making viability, also viable in some of these countries, you can also economic scale. Really, you need uh, communities that are clustered together in order for you to make a sense of vision a lot easier. So if you look at also the SDGs and uh, what we're trying to achieve, most of the, the gap is in communities, Indian communities, living areas where uh, they're marginalized within the rural areas. Uh, so effectively for us to make a change, we need to make sure there's access to these particular communities, because that's where we have most need. So in your experience, how can we address that problem, given some of the biggest issues? Because uh, the, the challenge is that are not in areas. In communities where they are uh, in the cluster, they are being in the outcome. So I'm just interested in knowing people that have done uh, projects and have been active within some of these uh, regions. Uh, how, how much that has been constrained <coughs> and also the solutions that we also see to be able to solve some of the challenges. It's a quick question. Yeah, I find this the big, uh, the big problem. I mean, uh, I think Rome also alluded to it. And I, I worked for Amref and also working in uh, Kajara, for example. It's a very rural area, Kenya. To be honest, I, I, that's where I went back to your question. That I, I, that's where I don't believe in the business case. So I think it's it's a public, it it it's a public responsibility in Kajara. Meaning that the government should step in, and if the government does not step in on a grant basis, then others might be able to step in. But and, and, and then you transform towards a situation where you where you indeed are are 
organized in a way that the communities is scale can kick in. But until that point, I have, I have, I have a very bad uh, uh, feeling about private finance. In the there are examples, of course, so your Senegalese Sy example is a good example, but also there, there's uh, uh, public money uh, 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 being uh, put to work. <laughs> But you're, you mentioned in the beginning also that the Dutch water sector is able to attract finance on the cost of triple A yeah, rating. Yeah, but, but the Dutch water sector is, is 100% urban. Yeah, but also before we went Almost. into that phase that that is possible, there was a very big government finance injection and before we read 100% corporate money yeah, back to services and yeah. Yeah. all the assets yeah. have been paid by the corporate Yeah, board. And that's when you have a good situation for inflation. Yeah. So I find in the development finance or in the development world to, to be totally focused because the, because that's the paradigm or something to, to, to keep on pushing for business cases is simply not fair. No, no, this is yeah. not the answer no. for the risk of the yeah. So that might be uh, from a private finance perspective bad news, right? Do you have any other thoughts on this question or can you turn it over? Celine, do you have a question? Uh, Celine Stark here, uh, IHC graduate. Um, in my thesis, I was monitoring one of the SDGs, an economic indicator SDG 4.1. Uh, and what I heard now that uh, what attracts investors are one, uh, good governance, good local currency, predictability, last year. But I was thinking about the countries who are dealing with hyperinflation, for example, um, bad governance. What about those countries? Is, is there no hope for those countries to get investments like this? Or, I mean, most of them are developing and in others. But for example, the case of Lebanon, and I was seeing how the hyperinflation is also affecting this specific SDG. But what about other countries dealing with hyperinflation, which is also many countries are dealing with this now. So what do you do with those countries? You don't work? With them, or if you do, how you deal with such um, factors? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Actually, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, which I think it comes back to uh, the point of view. I think when, when there is no private investment, the public or the public government should step in. And uh, I think there is a big responsibility of governments to to reach this, those SDGs. We have, you know, Together, decided that we would reach those, and and, um, and and I think the public sector should take the first leadership role in in um, making sure that everybody has access to, to clean water. And uh, even I think when the public sector does such a step, it already is uh, a sign for the private sector to step in or not. Or so I think. That comes back to what yours was explaining. So maybe that's not the case of the day. There is no business case there. Now, I've got three specific things actually for that problem. Uh, or it's, it's, it's a big thing that you address. But if you would, uh, so uh, if if the the purchase of equipment take living on, it's in a hyper uh, hyper inflation situation. But if the equipment being put to work in a certain project is locally produced then that local currency problem is sort of mitigated. Another way to mitigate the local currency problem is if you need hard currency, you could ensure it's also in a high inflation situation uh, with a company called TCX, that's also in the Bernard Development Group. Uh, they basically have positions, they trade in uh, development uh, country currencies worldwide. So the, the, the West African friend as well, while the Lebanese pound, I think it is, yeah, when like this pipe goes down, uh, they can take the risk, right? Because of the, the how do you call it? The, the, the hedge, the hedge. Uh, so that, it, it's not, I mean, it might be in this specific, specific case that they won't step in, but uh, there are there are mechanisms, and that's what all this, what we've been discussing about, uh, what, we've been, what we've been discussing today is about, right? Another example is, is guarantees. So for example, the most, most well, most bankable projects don't need any de-risking. Uh, a guarantee is that you put money available, contingent, so it's, 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 only, it's, it's not being put to work, it's only put to work when, when uh, a default situation occurs. Uh, and that security crowds in other investors. And, that, and that's, that, that is in a, in a developing country uh, uh, 
needed, while it's in, a, in a, another uh, context not needed, right? So I would not say that it's hopeless if uh, if, the, if the situation is uh, is poor, if the context is poor. But uh, uh, yeah, th that's what it is all about. Yeah. Yeah. And let's be very honest. In, in the case of Lebanon, um, I mean, sure there's hatches, but they're extremely expensive, and yeah. I don't think they you know, try not to use them because it costs way too costly. And in the case of Lebanon, when the country is almost in default and there's hyperinflation, I mean, all credit departments, to our organizations, so stop, stop. And, and it's not even our organizations, it's also uh, uh, donors, right? At the European Commission, they have a very clear mandate to what kind of country you pay they can go. And, and we would stop. Yeah, yeah but the thing is, um, the number of countries needing hyperinflation is increasing. It's not only about one or two. So yeah, we were going to talk about it in the world. So the, like if we want to achieve SDG, those countries are the one need, needing to achieve the most. So we're not going to look at those countries and we want to achieve SDG where countries where we can actually, I don't know, invest. So I don't know. Yeah, I think the, sort of, well, the, the problem you, you would want to solve for this is it's a refresh your proposal basically in, in then the finance instrument that use, for example, a guarantee to take away inflation risks in the investment. But so far as I know, there are no other. I think the, the problem often is, is like investors want stability, right? Yeah. I, 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 I don't know the current situation in, in Lebanon, but I, I, I assume that there is also some talks on how to restore it, and eventually it, the situation will become stable again. Yeah, Be, it's not only Lebanon, Sri Lanka, any other yeah. countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. yeah yeah, uh, but what I find interesting and what's actually important about, I think, your question as well is that I think uh, private investments also contribute too often instability if they pull out their money out of the country when things go down. I, I think especially uh, having a long-term perspective is very important uh, with that, and I think then with finance and also developing banks like FMO can, can provide that. Uh, I think that that is also something to, to, to keep in mind that, that you don't make the, the, the situation even worse uh, with private finance. And one more like, financial uh, point of view is usually you have the cost of capital and then it costs a certain price. And all these risks that you are mentioning, they add to that soon. So investors would like to have uh, would like to be repaid yeah. for that additional risk that you just mentioned. And that, that, I think that that's always you know, a debate. And I don't know how FMO, for example, looks at it. But does it mean for you, if you see that the cost of capital is extremely high because of all these uncertainties, does it mean that you rather don't do the investment? Or it doesn't mean for you, like, okay, we just hedge it or we blend it to make the cost of capital go lower? And you can share but how you look at that. I, I mean, our, our purpose is market creation. Uh, so eventually we want to third project that, that will then afterwards, once the model is proven, be receive finance from the market. So how we, how we mostly do that is that we, we look at, at market rates, these can be quite high, and then we, we try to, to take more, more risk in a way. So go somewhere where the market doesn't go. So go for a longer tenor or go into a sector that's currently not uh, receiving any market finance. But we try to kind of keep this interest rate as a as a benchmark, and if we can go below that, uh, but then we do need to have a, a good story because I mean once the project is, is completed, ideally you want to because we're a development bank, we do development, you do want to, to refinance it. Uh, you also want the, the model to work, so that that concessionality on, on the interest rates is something that we're careful with. Uh, if it really brings added benefits to the, the, the underlying people or, or, or then you can do that, but, but it, it is, it, yeah, it, it showcases that the business model by itself is maybe not strong enough to do that. I think that's, that's maybe the holistic approach. I think that that's more common to development finance, feedback investors, uh, because they know that the market they're dealing are more uncertain uh, than uh, in the more developed market. In a very efficient market, such as uh, here, for example, uh, you don't have that flexibility. Uh, an investor can always choose investment A versus B, and he just takes the one that I return. When it comes to SDG and impact, you know, you take a lot more holistic approach here. Yeah. Sure.
uh, of your remarks, I think uh, we, sh we need to address uh, that conflict as well. Uh, I think the hyperplate is often uh, caused by, by instability, right, as you mentioned. That instability is also often caused by by water related and water related uh, by farmers that don't have water anymore, so they have to move to uh, to the urban areas that they they don't they get too crowded. There is not enough water there, and then things blow up. Uh, that that is addressed. That will be addressed also at the conference. Uh, but it's important to keep that in mind while trying to solve also the the. the the private investment uh, part of the, maybe more the water, either the water supply, but also the these wood concrete. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, I think maybe we have time for one more question, if anyone. I think she was up with her hand for the beginning. Helen. Helen. Yeah, please. Hi. Sorry. Um, my name is Helen. Uh, I graduated here, and my thesis was a little bit on the other side, looking to the what the, my, uh, my friend, a friend uh, questioned. Uh, so what I learned here, and I'm extremely uh, happy because this is a diversified panel that I would find anywhere, maybe all together. I see that uh, you brought scale up business model. Uh, financial interest and something like this and uh, the idea is to maybe move this business case or scale up to some country but however I, I learned that also it's this um, bank bankability is highly selective so it, it's according to the, this enabling environment that you mentioned and uh, as my thesis I question how operational management decision is made in a public uh, water utility that start to commercialize water. And I have now it's very problematic for me to see uh, how we will solve because I think the overall objective is to give water access. Mm. It's not other way around. How to the risk or something like mm. that. It's the water access and the distribution. And it's, it's very interesting to learn that there is many other options and uh, bringing this business model might work somewhere and it, at the end of the day it brings to the question of how the government should step up and uh, give people financial empowerment not just for water for other things and then it's really I found this this opportunity really to bring us together to and this the UN water is coming to think how generally we, we are giving people empowerment, dignity, not not to sorry, not to focus how to the risk because this is not my main focus. Main focus is to give people water access. Because again, water access is linking to all other development in our society. So I, I really like the uh, uh, I'm uh, no, sorry, I don't remember the name, but to change the narrative of our discussion because we will be here another 20 years and the Mar del Plata conference and after 46 years is happening again. Why? It's not only because you mentioned it, but it's because we need a vivid body to connect all these sectors to, together. You know, it's, not, it's not a water sector, but to connect, you know, bring this water connector. Otherwise, we will be discussing for more time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Peter already mentioned before we uh, started this discussion, this will be the last one conference we've got. Yeah, it's my ambition that this will be the last water conference. Because what would otherwise be the reason to have such a conference, right? Uh, so that's my personal uh, life goal and how to contribute to the conference. Do you want to add anything else? There, there are many ways to achieve it. It would be great. Yeah. No, but I mean, Ellen, I think you're touching on like the ultimate friction here. It's like there would be no financing gaps in the world in any sector, water, energy, whatever you name it, if public governments were to meet their like public service mandate and supply the infrastructure that meets these water service needs, the people. But the reality is, is a lot of governments in the world that the funding is just the public funding is not there. But that's why it's, I think, your, to your question originally as well, it's like, it's an area that clearly needs a lot more work, a lot more research, because blended finance is one methodology. Bankability is a term that 
a lot of people would contest and a lot of people really don't like actually. Uh, and I think there's maybe better, maybe more creative ways to look at this, but the question is how and where will that money come from? And yeah, maybe this is uh, not the path forward, but this is, I think, at least it's where there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of discussions going on in this field. So I guess hopefully the point or what I hope some of you got out of this was today that there is uh, quite some momentum and there's action and innovative thinking going on in this space. But I, that's why I wanted to bring it open to this public and have the kind of this panel and this forum, you know, see what the other, you know, the other side and the questions you're raising exactly because that really is the core of the matter. And you illustrate why, why it's all very challenging. Um, so without, with, with that, I think it's a great question to, to end on because there's no immediate answer. Uh, or do you have a, Johan, do you have something? Yeah, first of all, we want to thank you very much for organizing this uh, conference in the building of uh, IHC uh, Delft. Mm. Congratulations. Uh, my name is Johan van Dijk, I'm the part of the management board in the, in the Institute. Um, we're working on this water and finance agenda for quite some time, we're developing this. So I have one simple question, maybe each panel member could give one or two keywords of what we should do in the area of education, research, capacity development, and that would be hopefully also contributing to this very challenging situation that was uh, posed uh, a minute ago. What should we do? One or two words. You <laughs> this small person would no. mark. Just bridge the engineering and uh, finance uh, knowledge gap. I am mm. an engineer by trade, but I couldn't find real good courses on water uh, finance. So. No. And yeah, the other. My answer as well, but I think I think you didn't lack uh, that's you didn't affect what they lack like, this proactive uh, approach of looking forward, making this uh, making an investment plan, being able to develop a whatever it is bankable project. But, but it's not lacking uh, at that level. But, uh, maybe also focus on water entrepreneurship uh, in local context. So I think there are many international students on their want to entrepreneurs. They just focus on that. Yeah, I, I tend to agree very much with what uh, he said, and, and that and you, uh, yeah. I think you also uh, emphasized that, so that there's uh, sufficient uh, attention within certain courses, I don't know which one exactly, but on, uh, on the CFO role uh, of any other uh, related uh, venture. Um, and the other thing I would like to, uh, uh, but I'm not sure whether that is among uh, I, I, within IHE's, IHE's mandate, but that's another point I alluded to uh, earlier, is that you contribute to full leadership and that you, that you uh, 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 advocate for the, for, the, for the issue, right? So uh, make sure that, that yours, I, I think IHE is one of the best organizations in the world with respect to water education. So it would be very good if that stamp of quality is uh, is also sort of transferred to the water finance uh, uh, issue. You know, something I, I would add to maybe very pragmatic and self-centric, but what would help us very much is if we can tap into the network even more and whenever there's opportunities, better be with students or professors in developing economies and being put in contact. I actually do not have much to add to what has been said here. Yeah, I, I would look at, at cases. I think that is important. And, and link to that, entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, right now we, we talk more to financiers and, and maybe the policy side of things, but it's really the entrepreneurs where I think the, the true action happens. Uh, so I think that, that is that's critical. And, and they often have also very interesting stories to tell. Yeah, echoing what they are saying, but I think you in order to improve uh, this, the decision making on water and finance. So are we uh, taking into account the multiple perspectives mm -hmm. that there are? I mean, look at this panel, right? Are there sufficient perspectives at place here that, that try to be more inclusive, try to be more transparent in, in our decision making? Uh, so I think that's, that's important. And uh, yeah, really try to look at the value of, of water and place value in the, in the water in a, in a bigger system. Yeah, thank you for those thoughts. Did you have one last thought? I saw your hand. 
Yes, I would like to be thankful my former work at IT. Uh, at that time, we had a, a capacity building program uh, which was called Water for African City, where we were giving uh, training on the job uh, for people in the utilities. And finance was not part of it, but it should be part of it. So, if you have the chance to develop this capacity building program, uh, addressing all the dimensions uh, and not only uh, financing but also human behavior. Uh, it's not only really about social science because it has to do with that. It would be very nice. And you have also the opportunity to develop group, group training. I mean, it's something that I actually used to do. Why not group training focusing on the financing aspect? I mean, it is very uh, things that can get funded quite easily and that you can uh, develop in any community. Really? Friday, last point? Yeah, just to say maybe uh, water governance mostly in most African countries is done at the political level. So the looking for today's masterclass is trying to the politicians to be the ultimate decision makers. So also talking to the leadership issue and the multi faceted uh, approach to the part. And that's also something that we can This is great. Thank you very much. I just all, all I want to say is just thank you so much for especially to the panelists, but also for the wonderful questions from the audience and for all of you coming here on this beautiful sunny day. Because I know you didn't have to be here, but it means a lot. And yeah, I think IHG has an opportunity to explore further research in the space. I think it's definitely much needed. Um, so with that, once again, huge thank you to the panelists. So please, a round of applause for all of them.